Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This uh, is an action entitled State of Ohio Plaintiff versus George Washington Wagner the Fourth Defendant. Case number 2018, CR 155. And it comes on for another day of uh, jury trial today. Today is the 19th day of September 2022. The defendant is present in court today with his attorneys, John Parker and Richard Nash. And the uh, state of Ohio is represented by the prosecuting attorney, Rob Junk, and by um, special prosecuting attorneys, Angela Canepa and Andrew Wilson. Also present is Ryan Scheider with Ohio BCI and I. Uh, one matter the court wanted to mention, um, juror A116, who is seated in seat 10, has expressed uh, a little bit of difficulty with her uh, uh, back and so has asked to be placed in another type seat. So we have made an accommodation by adding one of the softer seats down here. I assume that that doesn't bother any of the counsel. But, uh, objection. Uh, we certainly have no objection on that, Your Honor. We, uh, and hopefully everybody else is all right with that. So we'll just leave the one seat that she had occupied unoccupied and put her in an extra seat that we've added to the area where the alternates are. She remains a regular juror, though, of course. Um, as soon as we get the jury in here, then uh, we would have uh, the witness that the state had on the stand was still direct, uh, examining direct examination of Shane Hans, uh, Hanshaw, and we'll have him occupy the seat after we get the jury in here. Was there anything uh, further um, that either counsel for either side wishes to put on the record before we bring the jury in? No. And my intention is just to remind Officer Henshaw of the, the oath that he, we administered on Friday. Bring, uh, we can bring them up then. May all be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Good to see you all here today. Uh, when we uh, recessed on Friday afternoon, you'll recall that uh, Agent uh, Shane uh, Henshaw was in the witness chair and was being uh, examined uh, by the state's attorneys. And so that's where we'll pick up this morning. So, uh, Jason, if you could have uh, uh, Agent Henshaw enter and occupy the witness chair. Good 
Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Agent Henshaw, I would just remind you that we administered an oath on Friday morning. That oath that we administered at that time is still in effect today. Yes, sir. If you'll have a seat there. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Is the defense ready? Yes. All right. The state may continue direct examination of uh, Agent Henshaw. Henshaw, I have put back up for you and for the jury what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A547. Again, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And just so we're making the record clear, can you tell us what that is? Uh, it's a, uh, a sketch that was prepared by the Bureau of Criminal Investigation of the residence located at 4077 Union Hill Road. I'm going to hand you another stack of pictures. Can you look at those pictures for us? Just generally, do you recognize those pictures? Yes, sir, I do. And do you recognize those pictures as pictures that you took in this case and that you reviewed in preparation for your testimony in this case? Yes, I do. All right, last Friday when you were on the stand, do you remember we testified, or you testified, about the ballistic evidence that you found at 4077 Union Hill Road. Do you remember that? Yes, I did. And do you also remember testifying about the blood evidence that you observed and took some swabs from there at 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes, sir, I do. In addition to that, do you remember talking or testifying about shoe print evidence that you observed and collected there at 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes, I do. All right. In addition to ballistic evidence, in addition to blood evidence, in addition to shoe print evidence, was there other evidence in that living room and kitchen area that you collected there at 4077 Union Hill Road as part of your work in this case? Yes, there was. Mr. Jones, can you give me State's Exhibit A-167? I'm putting A-167 up. That's not one of the pictures that you have in front of you. Again, this is a picture that we've used with the jury on several occasions. Can you just go ahead and orient the jury uh, what we're looking at there uh, and what part of the house they're in? May I stand, Your Honor? Yes. Yeah. Once again, uh, this is one of the photographs we viewed earlier on. As I uh, previously testified that before entering the residence, I did look inside, took some photographs from there. If you look here in the corner, you'll see the actual door jam that putting me outside on the front porch, looking into the residence from the porch. And last week you testified that there was a, a speaker uh, or a large speaker uh, in that room. Can you point to the jury or point to that speaker and show the jury where that speaker is? Yes, the large speakers right behind the chair. In addition to the ballistic evidence you found in and around that speaker, was there evidence you collected from a box on top of that speaker? Yes, there was. Can you give me State's Exhibit A399, please? State's Exhibit A399, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a closer view of the area that would contain a large speaker and also a small speaker. Did you collect evidence from the box uh, that's pictured in that exhibit? Yes, I did. Okay. And if you want, you can go ahead and sit back down. We'll work off your pictures. Can you give me State's Exhibit A401, please? Can you tell the jury what's depicted in this exhibit? Uh, yes, uh, Exhibit A401. If you recall, again, just to orient where we are, uh, we just discussed the large speaker. This was sitting on top of the large speaker in a box, and it was a notebook. Uh, within the notebook, there appeared to be multiple names and phone numbers, and I felt that it could somehow be relevant or it could come into play later. Okay. Did you mark that item with a unique BCI item number and a, a photo placard and document it? 
Yes, I marked it as item number 39. Uh, once again, it's documented with a placard and it was collected and packaged. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It states exhibit A524. You might wanna put those on because you're gonna need those. Here. You don't need them for this exhibit. States Exhibit A524, do you rec recognize the markings on that packaging? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at? Exhibit A524 is my item number 39, which you can see uh, in the, the last photograph, uh, 401, and it, it appears to be the notebook uh, that was collected with the names. It's packaged in my packaging. It has my original label. And again, my initials on the back. Okay. And can you do me a favor? That package has already been opened for you. Can you pull the item out? Display it to the jury and tell us what we're looking at. Good. This is uh, item number 39 that was seen in the photograph. I'll take it from you for a second. All right, I've opened up that exhibit, that notebook, to a page. The page that I opened it up to, again, do you recognize uh, the information on that page is the information that it was open to uh, on the day that you collected it? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, and can you tell us the, uh, the, the last dates associated with the names in that, uh, that document? Just the date? Uh, the date and the name, that's fine. Uh, the, the name is Billy, and the date is 4-21-2016. All right. Did you collect this item, maintain it, and store it in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, I did. And ultimately, would that have been stored at BCI or a secure property room until trial? Yes, sir. In addition to that notebook in that kit, in that excuse me living room area, did you also find uh, a broken pair of eyeglasses and the lenses to those to that eyeglass? Yes, I did. Okay, talk us through that. Where did you find those things? And if you can point to the uh, the, the diagram there, show the jury where you found those items and what you did when you found them. It's actually listed on the diagram as item number thirty one and item number thirty two. 31 being here in the almost center of the living room. Uh, there was uh, blood evidence, if you recall, testified to last week, uh, 20 and 21. 20 was in that area as well. And 32 was another uh, piece of those glasses being over at the entrance of the kitchen area. Okay. I'm gonna ask the press not to display the next couple of pictures. Mr. Junk, if you could give me State's Exhibit A, 358, please. Can you tell the jury, I, I put up on the screen, State's Exhibit A358, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there and what is depicted in that picture? I stand. Yes, please. Uh, this is what I just uh, basically explained. Here you would have a lens, item number 31. Here you would have item number 32 being the glasses without a lens. And here, uh, I think we've discussed what would be a blood pattern there. It appears to be a drag mark, and there's a large accumulation of blood in that area. Mr. Junk, can you give me the next picture? Again, with respect to your item number 31, did you document that, give it a unique BCI item number, and eventually collect that? Yes, sir, I did. And I put on the screen what's been marked for identification purposes in State's Exhibit. A359. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at, at there in State's Exhibit A359? In A359, uh, obviously, it's just a close up a photograph of the lens in its original location prior to any alterations are being moved. 
I'm going to give you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-516. I have, I have, yes. State's Exhibit A-516. Do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, the markings. Uh, first of all, this is my original packaging, it appears. It has my original label, my item number 31. My description uh, that it is uh, an eyeglass lens from basically the center of the living room area, and it does have my initials. All right. Could you go ahead and open that for us, please? you tell the jury what that is? Yes, it's a eyeglass lens represented in the photograph as item number 31. You know, at this time I'd ask uh, for the witness to be allowed to publish that item for the jury. Any objections? No objections. Agent right. Hanshaw, could you do me a favor? Could you come off the stand and just walk in front of the jury with that so they can see the condition of that item? And if you could, go ahead and put it back in this packaging for us. State Exhibit 516. Again, the way that you uh, just displayed it to the jury, is that the way it appeared the day that you found it and collected it? Yes, it is. And did you collect, maintain, and store this in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, sir, I did. And would it have been stored in a secure manner until it was brought to court? Absolutely, yes. Mr. Junk, can I get State Exhibit A360, which I believe is the next picture? All right, State Exhibit A360 which I have up on the screen there. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, A360 is a photograph, uh, kind of an overhead photograph of the glasses, uh, the actual frames, uh, with the exception there appears to be one of the arms is missing and a lens appears to be missing. It's located right at the threshold, leaving the uh, living room area as you would be entering into the kitchen. Okay, and again, does that exhibit that's up on the screen, does that truly and accurately depict the way you observed that item on the day that you collected it? Yes. Did you give it its own unique BCI item number and photo placard? Yes, I gave it BCI item number, my item number of 32. Uh, it was uh, photographed, it had been photographed multiple times and eventually collected and packaged. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-517. Do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury uh, what you recognize or how you recognize that package? Yes, A-517. Uh, this is my packaging. It has my initials on the back, half on, half off the tape. Uh, also, it has my original uh, evidence label, evidence number 32. Uh, there is a sticker covering it, but it appears to be uh, that I labeled it as eyeglasses and the rest is covered. Uh, it, uh, once again, it is my original packaging with my initials. Could you do me a favor? Could you open that packaging for us?
Do you recognize the items in that packaging? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury uh, what that is? Yes, this is my item number 32 that we've seen in the photograph. Okay. You know, at this time, I'd ask permission for the witness to publish this exhibit to the jury. No objection. This time, could you come down off the witness stand and show the jury State's Exhibit 517? Now, at the time you collected that item, was the lens still in it? It was at that particular time, I believe. Okay. Does it appear that since the, the lens in the packaging has popped out? Yes. Put that item back in its package, please. Yes. I hold on. Yeah. You switch gloves? Yes, it had blood on it. Okay. Big exhibit A517. Again, did you collect this item in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, sir, I did. And would it have been uh, collected, maintained, and stored in a way that would have been secure until it was brought here to the courthouse for trial? Yes. You're going to need to put on another pair of gloves for me. Mr. Junk, can you give us State's Exhibit A363? In addition to those eyeglasses, did you also collect a ball cap from the kitchen area of 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes, I did. Uh, can you tell the jury uh, on the diagram, the, the big board there, where was this ball cap that you collected? Ball cap is in this area. Okay. I think it's there. And we put up on the screen what's been marked for identification purposes. It states exhibit A363. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there in states exhibit A363? Yes. Uh, I think I stated Friday as well that the majority of the photographs that we'd seen at that point were photographs looking from the angle of the front door. This is a photograph now uh, that I'm to the point of the investigation. I'm moving back toward a bedroom, and now I am in the kitchen looking back facing back toward the living room area uh, and you can see the uh, item number 34 in the photograph which is the Jets ball cap. Okay. Uh, did you give this item again a unique BCI item number, photo placard number and then photograph it from far to near? Yes I did. Can you give me state's exhibit A362? Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, once again, this is the same uh, Jets baseball hat. Uh, it's just from a little different angle and a little closer. Now, as you examined that item and got a closer look at it, did you notice damage to that particular ball cap? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you describe to the jury uh, what you saw? It looked like it had perforations or it looked like that uh, the, the fabric in it had been uh, altered in some way uh, or torn, I guess you could say. Can you give me State's Exhibit A368? State's Exhibit A368, can you tell us what we're looking at there? Yes, A368, once again, it's the same uh, hat, but based on this angle, you can uh, begin to realize why we take so many photographs and from so many angles. You can see what appears to be damage to the bill of the cap. Uh, it appears to be somewhat torn loose from the rest of the cap as well. Can you give me A369, just the next picture? Again, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there in State's Exhibit A369? 
Yes, A369 is the Jets hat. Uh, it's my item number 34 located in the kitchen area. And now you can uh, see some very distinct damage to the bill uh, where it connects to the hat as well as the bill itself. Did you ultimately collect that item uh, for evidentiary purposes in this case? Yes, sir. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A519. Can you take a look at State's Exhibit A519 for us? Yes. Do you recognize the markings on that packaging? Yes. Exhibit A519. Uh, to begin with, it is my packaging. It has my initials. Uh, it has my original evidence label uh, consistent with item number 34. And I have it documented as a New York Jets hat from the kitchen floor. Do you also see other markings on that packaging that indicate that it went to the lab or other lab labels? Yes, I do. Can you go ahead and open that item for us? And when you remove what's inside that item, just be careful for me with respect to bring it out kind of slowly. I don't want you to drop anything. When you bring it out, bring it so it's so the open end of that hat is up, so that if there is something in the, the ball cap, there you go, just like that. Can you tell the jury? Do you recognize that item right there? Yes, this item is what we just observed in multiple photographs: the hat, the Jets hat, New York Jets hat. Uh, my item number thirty-four that was located in the kitchen. And is there an envelope inside that item as well? Yes, there is. And are there markings on that envelope? Yes. Okay. Could you do me a favor? Just set that envelope to the side. Well, let me ask you this. At some point, did you later learn that when that item was being examined, a uh, possible piece of a projectile fell out of it? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask permission for the witness to come off of the stand and to publish this item for the jury. And All right, you may do so. I'm actually going to have you come out here. I'm going to have you stand right here at first, and I'm going to ask you some questions about that hat. When you examined that hat, did you find uh, what you believe to be uh, a bullet hole in the back of it? Yes. Okay. Could you do me a favor? Could you, you could spread that hat out a little bit. Can you show the jury what you're referring to with respect to a hole of perforation in the, in the back of that hat. Blood, dry blood on this. Okay, go ahead and say that a little louder. There's dry blood on this, and I'm just being very cautious about unfolding it. I don't want it to become airborne. Okay. Are you able to see the hole that you believe to be a bullet hole? Yes. Okay. And if you could, show the jury. I just walk it in front of them, I guess, and show them where that hole of perforation is. On the inside, it may be easier to see. outside, if you could, walk the jury through and just put your finger on showing them the outside where it is. As you examine that whole or perforation from the outside. 
Did you notice any blowout or uh, any fraying of that hole on the back there that indicated that it was an exit wound as opposed to a, an entrance hole? It, it appeared to be an exit. That is what I initially thought it could be. Okay. At some point after further examination, were you able to look at that hat and, and possibly track where uh, that bullet had actually come out at the front of the hat? I knew that it was damaged here to the bill of the hat, but at that particular time, I did not know if it was an entrance or an exit in the rear. Okay. At some point, if you could, show the jury uh, what they're looking at with respect to the front or the bill of that hat. And if you could, could you pull that away a little bit to, to demonstrate the damage? And again, does it appear that that area of that hat has been pulled or torn or ripped yes. uh, away from the, the hat, the bill area there? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. And with respect to this front area of the bill here, again, does there appear to be uh, damage or disruption in the way that bill should look? Yes, there is. Okay. And at some point, again, you learned, or did you learn that uh, a projectile, or what appeared to be a projectile, had been located in that bill area? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. You can go ahead and put that back in there. See that? Actually, let me see that envelope. In here. Yes, please. They give it A519. Again, did you collect, maintain, and store this item? in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, I did. And you testified that you did recognize markings that indicated that it had been in the lab. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Your Honor, at this time, I believe the parties have a stipulation. All right. You can express that then. The stipulation would read that Exhibit A519, which is item number 34, collected from 4077 Union Hill Road and recovered from the kitchen floor of that address was sent to the lab for DNA testing. The stain on the hat and the interior hair headband were swabbed for DNA. Gary Roden's DNA was found in the swabbing of this item. Mr. Parker? That's correct. Right. The jury is instructed to find that that stipulation uh, is uh, you're instructed to find that that has been established as fact and uh, as if it had been established through evidence. Right. And I don't think we did this, but can you show the jury where that headband, or excuse me, not where the headband, where that hat was found in the kitchen on the diagram? Yes, right there. Okay, thank you. In addition to this hat, did you also find several cell phones in that kitchen area? Yes, sir, we did. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-429? I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes, or we're putting up on the screen what's been marked as State's Exhibit A-429. Again, do you have that picture in front of you? Yes, I do. That truly and accurately depict the way that area looked uh, the day that you did your work out there? Yes, it does. And can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to uh, the evidence in that picture and those placards? Yes, this is a photograph of, on the diagram. would have been somewhat in that area uh, on the up far side of the table. And there are multiple uh, cellular telephones there. Some appeared to, to be in old condition. However, we did collect those. Okay. Can you give me state's exhibit? A430. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A430? 
Yes, A430 is uh, just a close-up photograph of one of the cellular telephones found in that area. And obviously, did you mark that with its unique BCI item number and photo placard number? Yes, item number 43 uh, was used to mark that cellular telephone. I'm handing you what's been marked for identification purposes, States Exhibit A528. Can you take a look at that package? Do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, this is my original packaging, my original label, uh, number 43. Once again, my initials are on the back. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you open that up yes. and remove the item that's inside of it, please? multiple items in there as okay. it's been disassembled. Okay, yeah, be careful with it, please. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there in that exhibit? Yes, in this particular exhibit, it's uh, item number 43 but it appears that uh, it's been taken apart and some analysis, internal analysis may have been conducted. We talked about different sections that you have over there at BCI. We talked about the lab and we talked about crime scene and we talked about investigations. Do you also have a uh, computer crime section? Yes, a cyber crimes unit that okay. would work on things of this nature. Okay. And do they have forensic computer examiners who are able to basically look at phones and try to get information from phones or, or computers that you take into evidence? Yes, we do. And sometimes uh, does that require taking a phone apart to get inside and, and look for chips? Yes, it does. Okay. And the condition uh, with respect to that exhibit that you have in your hand, when you collected that phone, was it in one piece? Yes, it was. Okay. And does that appear, the, the fact that it's in uh, multiple pieces now, does that appear to be something that was done as, as other work in this case? Yes, I believe this would have been done by our people uh, right down to the small screws were saved uh, that were removed when the phone was taken apart. Okay. Thank you. you can put that back in the... With respect to State's Exhibit A528, again, was that collected, maintained, and stored, and eventually tested in accordance with BCI's, or your standards? Yes. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A431? State Exhibit A431 that's up on the screen. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, A431 is another photograph. Uh, basically the same area, just a different cellular telephone. And you can see I've given it a uh, separate item, item number 44. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State Exhibit A529. And I'm going to direct your attention to the back, uh, to the, the right is on the back of that. Again, you said you gave that a unique crime scene identifier. It's crime scene number 44. Uh, do you recognize that marking or markings uh, identifying that as crime scene 44 on the back of that package? Yes, I do. Okay. And again, sometimes uh, is that evidence sent off to other labs to do chip offs or other extra work that your lab can't do? Yes, sir. Okay. Could you do me a favor? Could you open that uh, item for us? If you could walk us through what was in the inside of that package. 
Uh, the envelope that we looked at earlier that said crime scene number 44 is actually was not my envelope. Uh, this is my original packaging. As you can see, it says uh, evidence number 44. Uh, it's my original label. It does have my initials. Can you open that package and tell the jury what's inside? Another small container and once again a disassembled cellular telephone and battery. Do you recognize that item as the item that you collected as part of your work at 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes. Okay. You can go ahead and put all that back in. And again, the fact that it's in multiple pieces and the fact that there's different writing on there and the fact that it's in a different package, does that indicate that it went to your computer crime section and they did some forensic analysis of this phone? Yes, I believe it does. Can you give me what's been marked for identification purposes, states exhibit A432? States exhibit A432, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, A432, once again, it's a uh, photograph of a, of a cellular telephone. This is my item number 45, and if you recall, uh, once again, it's still in the same general area in this corner. It's where it was been located. Marked? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Go ahead. It's where that item was located. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes. States exhibit A530. If you could, take a look at the A530 for us. Do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, A530 is my item number 45. Uh, you can see my original label, my initials on the back of the package. Can you open that package and tell us what's inside? contents of the bag listed as item number 45 is my item number 45 that I collected on that day. Is that item in multiple pieces as well? Yes, it is. Okay, and again, when you collected it from the scene out there at 4077, was it in one piece? Yes, I made no alterations to anything of this nature when I collected it. The fact that it's in multiple pieces, does it reflect that that, that piece of evidence also uh, may have gone to the lab for further analysis. Yes, it could. Can you put that back inside for us? <clears throat> Mr. Junk, can you give us State's Exhibit A-433, please? State's Exhibit A-433 that we have up on the screen. Can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, A-433 is my item number 46, and once again, it's another cellular telephone found in that same general location. I'm going to give you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-531. State's Exhibit A-531, do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, I do. Uh, this package is my original package. It appears it has my initials, has my original evidence label of number 46, and my description being a black a and AT&T cellular telephone. Can you also open that package and tell us what's inside? This appears to be the uh, same cellular telephone that you see 
uh, in A433, my item number 46. Okay. And again, in that bag there, is it in the same condition it was when you collected it? No, it's not. The fact that it's in multiple uh, pieces there, again, to you, does that indicate that it went to the lab for further examination? Yes. Can you put that... another stack of pictures here. Now you testified already about evidence that you collected and documented in the living room, evidence that you collected and documented in the kitchen of 477 Union Hill Road. At some point, did you continue to move through that residence back towards the back bedroom where the bodies were? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, walk us through generally what you did and uh, what you were observing as you moved back towards that back bedroom. As I was uh, proceeding toward the back uh, bedroom area, you should note that I had only been back there one time prior to this. Uh, there were not multiple trips made to that area, not out of disrespect for the victims. I just had so much evidence between myself and the victim that I felt I should take the evidence as I came in order not to disrupt anything between myself and the victim. And so as I worked my way back, uh, I followed what appeared to be uh, transfer stains of blood in the form of what I thought were drag marks that originated in the living room area and ultimately uh, ended in the bedroom area. And Mr. Junk, can you give us State's Exhibit A440, please? We have State's Exhibit A440 on the screen. Can you tell the jury what State's Exhibit A440 depicts? And if you could, maybe use that pointer and, and show us where that picture is taken from. This photograph, uh, A440, I would be in this general location looking back that direction. I believe you see a gun safe here, and it's referenced in the photograph A440. Can you give us State's Exhibit A441, please? Okay, again, tell us what we're looking at there. A441, once again, I'm moving back toward uh, that bedroom, uh, ultimately where our victims would be located. I've taken maybe one, possibly two more steps, and then taken an additional photograph as I move toward that direction. Mr. Junk, can you, can you back that up? I did that last exhibit. Okay, I backed up again to State Exhibit A440 for the jury. Back in 2016, were you roughly the same size, height, weight that you are now? A little bigger, sir. Were you? Yes, so sir, you, I was. Have you lost some weight since then? Yes, sir, I have. Uh, any idea how much you weighed back then? Yes, sir, I weighed 250 pounds then. Okay. As you walked towards that back, bedroom there did you have to move any of that stuff to the left did you have any trouble getting through that back hallway no my process as we know is not to alter anything uh, prior to its time and at this point I had not altered or moved anything I was just simply set a course for the uh, rear bedroom and work my way that way as I photographed okay did you have to crawl climb or in any other way alter your your path back there no. Can you give me State's Exhibit A443, please? Okay. Could you tell us what we're looking there with respect to State's Exhibit A443? Yes, in Exhibit A443, uh, if you look directly to the left, you will see a black surface and we can reference that from the last photograph as being the large safe. Uh, at the base of that, uh, we will see uh, two victims, uh, one being uh, Christopher Roden and the other Gary Roden. Walk us through when you document uh, a room where a body is found. 
How do you go about documenting that room and how do you go about documenting the, the bodies and what's the purpose of, of everything that you do in that documentation? Uh, that can uh, vary from scene to scene. Uh, sometimes you have to stop uh, in the general location you are and take a look around, see what your best options are uh, as far as moving around the bodies without altering anything. Uh, ultimately, you're trying to make your best effort not to change anything but to photograph everything uh, in the way it was when you found it. And ultimately, you are trying not to add anything or take anything away from that particular area or scene at that time. Okay. When you took this picture, uh, had you moved that blanket at all so you could get a better look at the bodies, or is this picture of that room as you found it? This is the way I found it. Okay. Can you give me State's Exhibit A445, please? Can you tell us what we're looking at there with respect to State's Exhibit A445? Uh, yes. Uh, a few uh, exhibits back, we looked at the photograph and discussed that our victims were there. I've now moved my camera up, uh, taking a photograph of that room from a, a, a different angle. I didn't want to stay locked in on my victims. I wanted to continue to process the area around my victims and document that as I went. Okay. You talked about the big safe that you observed in the room. Yes. I'm gonna to point to the picture here and then I'm gonna point up above. In this area where there's a fan in, in blue tote and some totes in a laundry basket, do you remember seeing or collecting a smaller safe at all from that area? I recall seeing it, but I don't think I collected that one. Okay. At some point after you document the general layout of the room, do you focus your documentation on the bodies? Yes, I do. Can you give me State's Exhibit A446? Can you tell us what's depicted in this picture and, and what you're trying to show? I'm trying to show the original position of the uh, hands of the victim. Uh, the fact, actually uh, the positioning of the clothing, uh, things of that nature can tell you uh, or enlighten you as to what may have occurred prior to your arrival. Uh, showing the, uh, the fact there's a blanket over the victim uh, and the general location of that victim. At some point, uh, as part of your documentation of a victim's body, do you zoom in and take pictures of their hands? Yes, I do. And I'm gonna give you a state exhibit A449. Can you tell us what's depicted in A449? Yes, this is a uh, close-up photograph of the victim's hands. Uh, trying to document, once again, the, uh, the condition of the hands, whether there could be evidence on the hands, whether there could be any trauma to the hands. And State's Exhibit A450? Yes. A450, once again, is a photograph uh, of our victim's hand, uh, showing, obviously, blood and some the condition of the clothing as well. Okay, and when we're talking uh, victim, is this the vic first victim, Chris Roden? Yes, it is. Can you give me State's Exhibit A451? Can you tell us what we're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A451? Exhibit A451 is a close-up of uh, our victim's leg. If you look closely, uh, you can see our second victim, Gary Roden, you can see his hand and the position of his hand uh, in relation to our victim's leg. All right, I'm gonna pop in here real quick. Let me see that picture. All right, I'm gonna point to that right there. Does that appear to be a nipple? Pardon me? Right here. Yes. In an armpit? Okay. Right. Yeah. Take a look at that again. I'm gonna back. I'll look back again. Let's go back to 
looking at 451, just keep 451 up there and then we'll put, let's see. Yes. We'll put 446 up on the screen. You hold 451 there. Yes. 446, Yep. Okay. Walk us back through with respect to 451 in comparison to, to 446. What, what are we looking at there at 451, which is not on the screen, but what you were just looking at? Actually, in uh, A451, if I turn the photograph up the correct way and look at it, it's obvious that looking at it in, a, in association with the way this label was on it uh, appeared to alter that. Okay. Now let's go back to uh, let's go back to 451, Mr. Jones. Yes. All right. In addition to this area of the victim's body, uh, is there an item on the floor there that you document? Yes, yeah, a small flashlight. Okay. Can you give me state exhibit A452? Can you tell us what we're looking at there with respect to State Exhibit A452? Yes, in A452, uh, you're looking at the, uh, once again, it's basically the same photographs we've been looking at. It would be the upper torso of Christopher Roden and the hand of Gary Roden uh, with a flashlight and some uh, uh, blood stains on the floor. And do you know, was that flashlight collected later as part of the, uh, the broader investigation in this case? Yes, it was. Uh, we knew that we were going to come back to this scene and we knew that there would be additional work to be done and that was uh, collected at a, a later time. Your Honor, I believe we have a stipulation. I'm sorry? I believe we have a stipulation, another stipulation. Mr. Parker, I believe on my list, I'm going to jump to stipulation number 17. Your Honor, for the record, at this time, the parties agree uh, with respect to the flashlight that is annotated in that picture, which will eventually be marked as BCI item, BCI item number 88. It has a lab number of 54, 54A, and 54B. That flashlight recovered in the north bedroom of 4077 Union Hill Road was sent to the lab for testing. That flashlight tested presumptively positive for the presence of blood. DNA testing on the unstained area of that flashlight, which was marked for lab purposes as 54A, showed a mixture of DNA containing Gary Roden as the major contributor. DNA testing was also done on the batteries and the battery holder, which was marked for the lab purposes as 54B, and that showed a mixture of DNA with Gary Roden being the major contributor. That's correct. All right. Again, the jury is instructed uh, that the jury is to accept uh, the stipulation to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence in the courtroom. Thank you, Honor. May I proceed? Yeah. Mr. Junk, can you give us State's Exhibit A456? At some point, do you begin to move around and document that second body in, the, in that room? Yes, I did. Can you tell us what we're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A456? A456 is a photograph. I've now uh, stepped into the, to the bedroom, and I'm trying to get uh, a basic idea of the positioning of what we would learn would be Gary Roden's body in relation to uh, the position of the body of Christopher Roden. In short, that can tell you a sequence of events. Can you give me State Exhibit A54, please? Excuse me, A454. I apologize.
Okay. Can you walk us through what are we looking at there with respect to State's Exhibit A-454? A-454, I've now moved closer uh, to the corner. Uh, on the right portion, you can see the actual corner of the bed. Uh, directly below that, you can see the uh, our second victim or what we would, uh, for investigative purposes, while we were there, we would uh, refer to him as our se second victim, which would have been Gary Roden. You can see his uh, face, large amounts of blood, and his head in relation to uh, the lower leg of Christopher Roden. Mr. Junk, can you go back one to State's Exhibit A-453? State's Exhibit A-453, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this would be uh, the arm of Gary Roden, and uh, it extends out uh, parallel with the bed, and there's uh, saturation stains or a large amount of blood on the, the uh, exterior of the jacket. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-461, please? Again, did you continue to, to work your way around that room and document those bodies in the condition they were when you found them? Yes, sir. Can you tell us what we're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A-461? A-461, uh, once again, is another photograph. Uh, earlier, uh, actually in the last few photographs, I've been on the other side of our victim, Gary Roden, and now I've stepped over and I'm working uh, on photography from another angle. Can you give me state, and again, is this the way you found them? You, you haven't done anything as far as moving them to get a better angle or anything like that? No. Can you give me state's exhibit A459? Can continue walking us through what you're doing there, what you're documenting? Yes, yeah, State's Exhibit uh, 459, I've uh, taken a step back and we're seeing the uh, almost the entire body there of Gary Roden and uh, lower portion of Christopher Roden's leg, as well as condition and the positioning of the clothing. Again, with respect to that body, Gary's body, uh, is that the condition you found him in? Arms overhead, sweatshirt basically rolled up. Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A460, please? And again, what are we looking at there? A460 is another photograph, uh, a different angle, the body of Gary Roden. And uh, I was noting there that he did have both of his shoes on, as well as the position of the clothing. Eventually, as after you documented how the bodies were as you found them, did you move Chris's body or was Chris's body moved so that you could better document uh, the injuries to Gary? Eventually they were moved. Uh, however, there were some other things that we completed prior to moving them. Okay, I'm gonna come back and talk to that uh, on that later, but what, what other things did you do? I'll, I'll cover that here in a few, but what generally what'd you do? Uh, there were some swabs taken from uh, various locations on our victim's bodies. Uh, those swabs, I uh, think we've talked about them, but they were uh, what we would call touch DNA swabs. In other words, if I would touch something, I may leave my DNA behind as sort of a latent fingerprint. And if I were to swab that area, I may find, and I have been successful in finding, a suspect's, victim on, uh, suspect's DNA on a victim's skin before. That's one of the things we tried. I also used a uh, forensic vacuum with uh, new sterile 3M uh, filters to take uh, forensic vacuumings of the victim's bodies. Okay, and all of that was before you actually moved them uh, so that you could better document the injuries? Yes. Okay, let's talk about that real quick. Again, you talked about touch DNA. Again, if I drag those bodies, if Andy Wilson drags those bodies to the back of the, that, that bedroom, and I've got gloves on, am I gonna leave touch DNA on those bodies? Most likely not. But you do that anyways, just in case, is that correct? Yes, at that particular time, you have no idea 
if a suspect was wearing gloves or not wearing gloves. After you did that work that you talked about uh, to, to collect or possibly collect other types of evidence, again, eventually did you move the body so you could better document the actual injuries to them? Yes. Okay. Let's start with Gary's body. I'm going to give you a State's Exhibit A483. Again, he's definitely our picture. Can you tell us what you're trying to depict in State's Exhibit A483? State's Exhibit A483 is a, a, just a general overall view of uh, the head area of uh, Gary Roden. In that photograph, you can see a lot of blood around the mouth, the nose, uh, discoloration around the eyes, and then what I thought appeared to be a bullet hole near the ear. And did you continue to document or get closer pictures of what you believed to be a, a bullet hole? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit 480, A484. Can you tell the jury what you're trying to depict there? Uh, A484, uh, once again, is a close-up of what appears to be a bullet hole in Gary Rogan's head. What is the purpose of, of taking those pictures with respect to that, that body at the scene? I want to document uh, this as much as possible. I can't control what anybody else does after these bodies are taken out of my care or after I'm going. So I want to document them as they were, uh, as I found them. And ultimately, with respect to the number of bullet holes or the number of times that uh, a victim is shot, uh, is that the coroner's responsibility to ultimately determine that? Yes, if it's not, if it's not uh, a visually uh, presents itself or the wound or I can't visually see it without making alterations, uh, I will photograph it. If it's something that I would have to alter the clothing or something of that nature. Uh, we don't alter those clothings anymore. We don't search for additional bullet holes because the clothing in its original condition could also help uh, during autopsy. Okay. Again, ultimately, the number of times somebody shot or trajectory of bullets in the body, that's not your call, is it? Absolutely not. All right. Now, you talked about taking swabs before you uh, move the bodies. You talked about taking swabs of the victim's hands. Uh, and again, is that for the purposes of touch DNA? Yes, it is. Did you do that on both of these victims? Yes, I did. Right, I'm gonna show you what's been marked for notification purposes. It states exhibit A481. States exhibit A481, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, A481 is a photograph and even though you can't uh, see what I was swabbing, I still wanted something to reference to later. So the swabs I took of uh, the victim's hand, uh, most times we take one swab as opposed to blood, we take two. There's a reason for taking one because you can concentrate more DNA on that one swab. And I numbered that as item 57. At the time, whether or not I took one or two, I don't recall. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-542. Can you look at State's Exhibit A-542 and do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, this is my evidence uh, label listed as number 57. It's my original packaging with my initials. Okay, can you tell the jury what it is? Yes, it's a swab from the right hand of uh, Gary Roden. And again, is that the swab that would have been depicted in the picture that's up on the screen for them? Yes. Uh, was that lab, or do you recognize uh, whether or not that swab was sent to the lab for further testing? Yes, it appears it was. Your Honor, at this time, we'd have another stipulation. All right, I'm going to state that for us then. Yes, Your Honor. John City, number 13. The party was, would stipulate and agree that the swab of Gary Roden's right hand in photo ID number 57, which has lab number 45, 
and I believe it states exhibit number A542, was tested for DNA. And the result was that it was a mixture of DNA with Gary Roden being the major contributor. Chris Roden Sr.'s DNA was excluded from the swap. That's correct. And the jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation to be established as fact, as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. Did you also swab Gary's left hand? Yes, I did. Can I get state's exhibit A482? My handy was been marked for identification purposes, state's exhibit A4, excuse me, A543. State's exhibit A482, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, state's exhibit A482 is a photograph of that hand, the left hand. Again, I've given it an item number, my item number 58, so that I could reference that particular swab at a later time. And then state's exhibit A543 that I handed you, do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, A543 corresponds with item number 58 in the photograph, and it is my swab. This is my packaging, my original label, and my initials. Okay, and again, was that swab also sent to the lab for DNA testing? Yes, it was. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. Mr. Parker, this will be number 14. Parties agree and stipulate that the swab of Gary Roden's left hand, which is state's exhibit A543, depicted by BCI item number 58 and lab number 46, was tested for DNA. It was found to contain a mixture of DNA with Gary Roden being the major contributor to that DNA mix. Chris Roden Sr. was excluded. His DNA was excluded from that swab. Mr. Parker? That's correct. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the jury is instructed to accept the stipulation to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence in the court. Okay, and we've talked about your documentation of Gary's body. Did you also document Chris's body as it was in the room? Yes, sir. I used the same procedure to document that body. Can you give us state's exhibit A457? And again, we've seen that picture, but can you tell the jury what's depicted there? Yes, this is actually the one I misidentified earlier. This is A457. It's a photograph. Once again, to orient ourselves, you can see the flashlight, the victim, Christopher Roden's upper torso, and the torso and face of Gary Roden. Can you give us state's exhibit A458? A458 is another photograph. Again, documenting the... Give me one second. Is that 458 as well? Oh, is it? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. A458 is another photograph of the upper torso of Christopher Roden. And notably, obviously, there's an accumulation of blood there on the chest area. But the positioning of the clothing there I felt was important. Okay, and again, when you looked at his body position, did you find his arms also to be up over his head and his sweatshirt or his shirt-type clothing rolled back over his head? Yes. Both of those victims with their arms over their head and their sweatshirts rolled up. Based on your knowledge or training experience, did you find that to be consistent with being drugged by their feet? That's what I felt at the time, yes. Okay. Down, as you went further down Chris's body, at some point did you find his wallet between his legs? Yes. Can you give me state's exhibit A455? Okay. Can you tell the jury what's depicted in state's exhibit A455? A455 
actually this particular photograph, I was looking at the lower portion of the jeans and uh, how it appeared that they had been uh, kind of squeezed together a little bit. And this would be the uh, lower legs of Christopher. All right, I'm going to bring you out with your pointer, if you would. Could you step out? Yana, can he step down? Yeah. Pull your pointer out. And when you talk about it appeared that the jeans had been squeezed, what area are you talking about? That area. Okay. And the same would be consistent on that side. And again, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, is that consistent with someone being drugged by their legs? Based on the fact of uh, positioning of the clothing, uh, the arms over the head, and then those uh, markings on the jeans, that I felt that that's what had occurred. Also of note in that picture, did you notice uh, that this victim had footwear on? Yes, both shoes. Okay, and did you notice whether or not those shoes were tied? Uh, yes. And were they? Yes. Okay. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-462? Can you tell us what we're looking at there in State's Exhibit A-462? In A-462, this is a, another photograph of the lower torso of Christopher. Uh, again, you can see the jeans, how they're bunched up in that area. And uh, if I can stand and point something out. Absolutely. Right in this area, it's very hard to see, but uh, a wallet was laying out in that. If you stay there. right there, I'm going to give you 463. You can give me State's Exhibit A-463. Exhibit 463, once again, uh, it's very hard to see with the lighting, but you can see the wallet. It's in an open position and appears to be some items there on the wallet. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-476? Okay. At some point, were you able to reach in between legs? Well, let, let's talk about that wallet for a second. Yes. Was that wallet in a pocket or was it loose between the, the victim's legs? It was laying just as you saw in the last photograph, loose. It was not in a pocket and I did not uh, make any alterations to it until I got to a point where obviously I had to collect and document it. At some point, uh, did you mark that item and co collect it uh, as evidence? Yes. And walk us through how you did that. Uh, once again, through the whole process, and we've talked about it, uh, we are dressed in Tyvek, our footwear is Tyvek, our gloves are changed regularly. That would be something that we would pull out, we would remove. And uh, ultimately, I didn't do a lot with that as far as getting into the wallet. I tried to keep that minimal. Uh, because I was concerned that there could be touch DNA on the exterior of that wallet, and I didn't want to destroy that. Okay. You can go ahead and grab a seat. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-439. Can you take a look at State's Exhibit A439? Can you tell us what that is? Yes, A439. This is my packaging. Uh, once again, that's my label. And on the uh, rear uh, is my initials. Can you open that? Yes. I've listed this as item number 54, and that would have been the wallet we saw in the photograph. Yes, uh, this is item number 54. It's the uh, same uh, wallet uh, that belonged to one of the victims. Was there actually an ID card in it? Yes, there was. Witness, just to step outside the witness box and publish that. You may do that. You got objections? No objections. Okay. okay. Could you show the jury the item and then pull out the ID card that's in it, please? There's actually the wallet. And there's the ID card. Whose ID card is it? That would have been uh, Christopher Ruby. You 
can put that back in that bag for us. take swabs of Chris Roden's hands the same way you did of Gary's. Yes, I did. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-479? Can you tell us what's depicted there in State's Exhibit A-479? Yes, A-479 would be my item number 55, and that would be uh, uh, one of our victim's hands. Uh, from that, I would have uh, collected swabs, as we discussed earlier, for the potential of touch DNA. On my handy, what's been marked for identification purposes states Exhibit A540. States Exhibit A540. Can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, A540 is my evidence, number 55. Uh, that was represented in the photograph by the placard. It has my uh, evidence label. As my initials on the seal, and it uh, my documentation of a swab from the right hand of Christopher, which would be Roden. Okay. And again, are there markings on that package to indicate that that item also went to the lab? Yes. And with respect to all of these swabs that we've talked about, were they collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your uh, standard operating procedure? Absolutely, yes. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. Thank you. Mr. Parker, this will be number 15. <clears throat> All right, the parties stipulate and agree that states exhibit A540, which is the swab from Christopher Roden Sr.'s right hand, as depicted in BCI item number 55, photo placard 55, which is actually lab number 44, was tested for DNA. The results showed a mixture of DNA with Chris Sr. being the major contributor in, oh, 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 I'm reading the wrong one, I'm reading 16. Let me back that up, let me start over. All right, State's Exhibit A540. State's Exhibit A540 is a swab of Christopher Sr.'s right hand, which is depicted in BCI item number 55 lab number 43 that item was tested for dna the results of the dna in that swab showed a mixture of dna with christopher roden senior being the major contributor and gary roden being a minor contributor did you also take swabs of christopher roden senior's left hand yes we would stick it Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So, with respect to the stipulation just stated, the jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation to be established as fact, uh, as fully as if it had been established uh, through evidence here in the courtroom. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Did you also take swabs of Christopher Roden Sr.'s left hand? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. States Exhibit A-541. And I'm going to ask Mr. Junk to put States Exhibit A-480 on the screen. States Exhibit A-541. you recognize that item? Yes, I do. This is, uh, once again, it's my package with my original uh, evidence label. It has my initials uh, from when I sealed it up. And it has my description of evidence number 56, uh, swab from the left hand of Christopher, which would be Christopher Rogan. And can you tell us what's depicted in State's Exhibit A480? That photograph A480, once again, is of the hand, and I have given it uh, item number 56. Uh, to represent the swab I have before me. 
States Exhibit A-541, was that collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedure? Yes, it was. And are there markings on that item that indicate that it was also sent to the lab for DNA testing? Yes, sir. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. All right. Mr. Parker, this will be number 16. The parties agree and stipulate that States Exhibit A-541 is a swab from Christopher Roden Sr.'s left hand as depicted in BCI item number 56, lab number 44. That swab was tested for DNA. The results showed a mixture of DNA with Christopher Roden Sr. being the major contributor and Gary Roden being a minor contributor. That's correct. The jury is instructed that the jury is to accept that stipulation uh, to be established as fact, <coughs> as fully as if it had been established uh, through evidence here in the court. Now, you also talked about before you moved those two bodies, you did a forensic vacuum of them. Tell the jury what a forensic vacuum, vacuum is and, and how a forensic vacuum works. That's relatively simple. Uh, we have a small vacuum uh, that are designated for that purpose and that purpose only. Would to be to look for trace evidence such as hairs, fibers, uh, anything uh, residual that might have been left behind. And in uh, the use of it, uh, that forensic vac, we have filters, and those filters, when we receive them, they are packaged in an individual sealed package, and they are 3M filters. We would take that filter out of that package, uh, hook it to our forensic vac, and from there, we would take a vacuuming of that body or area or furniture, whatever we're trying to find trace evidence uh, from. And once that particular uh, area is vacuumed, we then remove that filter and we actually put it back in its original bag that it came in because it was sterile. From there, uh, we would seal that bag and then I normally would put that bag in another bag and put my label and my signature on it. I know I've asked you this question before, but if I'm wearing a mask, a hood, and gloves, uh, is that going to impede my DNA from going somewhere where you're going to vacuum it up with your forensic vacuum? Yes, it can. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It states Exhibit A-533. Do you recommend, do you recognize the markings on that document? Yes, evidence number 48 uh, uh, is the what I've listed it on the package. This is my original package. It's my original label, has my initials. And I've documented it obviously as a 1-3-M filter containing vacuumings from the victim's outer clothing and exposed skin uh, from the victim with the black sweatshirt. At that time, we wasn't sure of the identity. And so I wanted to make sure I documented where it came from as being the black sweatshirt. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, stage exhibit A-534. Do you recognize the markings on that package? Yes, A-534. Uh, once again, this is my original packaging. It's my label, uh, my initials. And uh, I labeled it as and designated evidence item number 49. And at that point, I listed it as one 3M filter containing vacuumings from the victim's outer clothing and exposed skin, a victim with the shirt over the face, and obviously the filter number. Each filter has its own number. Both of those forensic vacuums, were they done, collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, they were. the forensic vacuum did you collect blind DNA swabs from throughout this entire residence yes I did I and special agent price did okay 
I put up for the jury what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A545. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Uh, once again, uh, A545 is a representative, uh, not the scale sketch of the residence at 4077 Union Hill Road. Okay, and with respect to uh, the type of evidence that's depicted in this diagram, what type of evidence is depicted? Uh, we have uh, samples of uh, suspected blood or biological evidence, and then we would also have blind swabs, uh, mainly looking for touch DNA, residual DNA that was left behind. Okay. Mr. Junk, can you give me state's exhibit a5471. Let's start. Since we're in the bedroom, let's start in the bedroom. 471, I'm sorry. A471. Did you collect some blind, blind swabs? from that bedroom area? Yes, they were collected. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-535. You have State's Exhibit A-471 on the screen in front of you. First of all, what's depicted in State's Exhibit A-471? This would be uh, actually the doorknob of the uh, vector, uh, bedroom that where both <coughs> bedrooms are located. And it's representing uh, blind swabs. And did you take a blind swab of that doorknob? Yes. And can you tell us what State's Exhibit A535 is? A535, uh, I believe that it is uh, evidence number 50, which is represented in A471 uh, as being a blind swab from that doorknob. Uh, again, it's uh, my packaging. And I listed it as a, a blind swab from the exterior door handle. Do you see markings on that item to indicate that it went to the lab? Yes, I do. You know, at this time we'd have another stipulation. All right. Mr. Parker, it's gonna be stipulation number 18. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A535 is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road identified as item number 50, it's actually lab number 58. That swab was sent to the lab for DNA testing. The DNA on that swab was a mixture of Chris Roden Sr. and Gary Roden. That's correct. All right, again, the jury is to um, accept the stipulation uh, just given to be established as fact, as fully as if uh, it had been established as fact through uh, evidence here in the court. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A-472? State's Exhibit A-472, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, A-472 is a photograph. Uh, it's entering into that bedroom where our victims were located. Um, you can see the blanket there, and we could reference that to other photographs so you can orient yourself as to where you were. Uh, I listed uh, that particular item as item number 51, which would represent a swab from that doorknob. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-536. State's Exhibit A-536, can you tell the jury what State's Exhibit A-536 is? Yes, A-536 is evidence number 51. It's the actual swab. Uh, that would be correspond to the, the photograph A472. It's a swab, uh, a blind swab collected from the door handle of that bedroom. And did you collect, maintain, and store that swab accordance, in accordance with your standard operating procedures? Yes, I did. And are there markings on that document or on that swab packaging that indicate that, that it went to the lab? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the parties would have another stipulation. All right, please state that. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation 19. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-536 
is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as BCI item number 51, lab number 59, and this swab was sent to the lab for DNA testing. There was insufficient DNA in this swab for comparison purposes. That's correct, Chair. All right, the jury is instructed to accept the stipulation just given to be established as fact, as fully as if it had been established as fact through evidence here in the court. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A-473? All right, State's Exhibit A-473. Can you tell the jury what's depicted in that exhibit? Yes, A-473, uh, simply a, a photograph of a light switch, the exterior light switch cover. And uh, swabs would have been taken from that, touch DNA swabs or blind swabs, and designated as being item number 52. Okay. And with respect to that item number 52, would the location of that swab or where that light switch is be depicted in your overhead diagram there? Yes, it is. Okay, where is it? Right in that area, just inside the door where the victims are located. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. As State's Exhibit A-537, State's Exhibit A-537, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, A-537 is my item number 52. Uh, we just saw the number 52 in the photograph, which represented this swab. And this is listed as a blind swab from the light switch in that particular bedroom. Again, was that swab collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. Are there markings on that swab that indicate that it went to the lab? Yes. All right, we have another stipulation. All right, please state it. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 20. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-537 is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road identified as BCI item number 52. It's actually the lab number 60. And that item was sent to the lab for DNA testing. That swab contained the DNA of Chris Roden Sr. as the major contributor. That's correct. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence given here in the courtroom. Mr. Junk, can I get... <coughs> picture or stage exhibit A 474 <coughs> Agent Hanshaw can you tell the jury what's depicted in state's exhibit A 474 yes A 474 is a close up of the uh, actually the target would be the handle of the safe. Earlier, we saw a large safe at the entrance uh, to the bedroom containing both victims. And uh, I gave it item number 53 to represent those swabs that would be collected. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. State's Exhibit A, 538. Can you tell the jury, do you recognize the markings on State's Exhibit A, 538? Yes, A, 538 is... Uh, my original item number 53 it's in as my label it's my packaging uh, has my initials and it has my notes of uh, being a blind swab from the safe from that bedroom again was that item collected maintained and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedure yes it was and do you recognize markings on that item that indicate that it also went to the lab yes you know, at this time, the parties would have another stipulation. Like stated, Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 21. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-538 is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as item number 53. It's actually lab number 61. And that item was sent to the lab for DNA testing. There is insufficient DNA on that swab for comparison purposes. The jury is instructed to accept 
the stipulation just given to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. Agent Hanshaw, did you also take swabs from other areas of that house? Yes, there were swabs taken from the living room area as well as the bed other bedrooms. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. The state's exhibit A512. State's exhibit A512. Can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, exhibit A512 uh, would be uh, listed as my item number 27. Okay. And on the overhead diagram, can you show the jury where that... Well, first of all, tell them what it is. Uh, it's actually... Uh, it's packaged in my packaging. It has my original label, my initials, and I have it listed as a blind swab from the entry door uh, or the uh, actual entry door of the residence. Okay. Can you tell the jury where on the uh, diagram that that blind swab was taken? Yes. If you go back to uh, where we all began here, uh, entering the residence, then you would have the door. There's an interior and an exterior door handle. Are there markings on that packaging that indicate that it went to the lab? Yes. Was that item collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedure? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time we have another stipulation. All right. You stated. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 22. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-512 is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as item number 27, which is lab number 16. This item was sent to the lab for DNA testing, and there was insufficient DNA in this swab for comparison purposes. Mr. Parker. That's correct. The jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation as established uh, as fact, as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. I'm going to give you up what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-513. State's Exhibit A-513, can you take a look at that? Can you tell us what that is? Yes, A-513 is my evidence, uh, number 28. Uh, it's an additional swab. It would have been from the interior portion of the door handle from the same door. Um, I did put it in, uh, obviously, this is my packaging. Uh, has my original evidence label and my initials on the back. Are there markings on that item that indicate that it also went to the lab? Yes. Was that swab collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedure? Yes, sir, it was. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. All right. Please stay. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 23. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-513 is the blind swab from 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as item number 28, which is lab number 17. That item was sent to the lab for DNA testing. The swab contained the DNA of Gary Roden. That's correct. The jury is instructed to accept the stipulation to be established as fact as fully as if it uh, had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A-514. Can you take a look at that? Yes, A-514 is my evidence number 29. Uh, it's a blind swab uh, from one of the uh, bedroom doors in the residence. Could you show the jury where in the diagram that is? In this area. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-515. State's Exhibit A-515, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, it's my evidence number 30. Uh, once again, it's blind swabs from the light switch on the uh, wall uh, near the entry door. Should have been over in this area. Actually, it is number 30. Yes.
Your Honor, this time, the parties would, well, I hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-521. Can you take a look at State's Exhibit A-521? Tell us what that is. Yes, A-521 is my evidence number six. Once again, it's in my packaging, my label, my initials. And it is a blind swab from the light switch in a bedroom. And it's represented as item number 36 in this corner. Can I hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-522? State's Exhibit A-522, do you recognize that? Yes, A-522 is my evidence number 37. I have it listed as a blind swab from the light switch in the middle bedroom. It's packaged in my original packaging with my label and my initials. And being item number 37, it's right there near the entrance to that door. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, the parties would have another stipulation. All right. Please state it. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 24. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibits A-514, A-515, A-521, and A-522 are blind swabs that were not submitted to the lab for further DNA testing. Thank you. Mr. Parker? That's correct. Again, the jury is instructed to accept the stipulation that was just given as established as fact, as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. Your Honor, we are probably at a good break point. I'm going to transition to another topic. All right. We have been at it for just approximately two hours, just a little short of that. So we are going to take our 15-minute morning break at this time. While you are on break, do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning this case. Do no research at all concerning this case, either as to the facts or as to the law. Do not read, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of this case from any source whatsoever and have no contact with the participants in the case, including, of course, parties, counsel, or witnesses. I have, well, it's about five minutes till 11, so 10 after 11, assemble at the jury room downstairs. You'll be brought up here by court personnel. Anything further from counsel for either side before the break? No, thank you, Judge. All right, then we are in recess for 15 minutes.
State ready to resume cross exam or yes, sir. direct thank examination. You. All right, you do so. Is your defense ready? Yes, thank you. Right. <coughs> Mr. Hanshaw, I'm going to put up for you and for the jury what's been marked for identification purposes. State's Exhibit A544. Again, is that? Exhibit we've used multiple times, but just so the record's clear what we're talking about, can you tell can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is the residence. Uh, we've been looking at it, 4077, uh, Union Hill Road. Now we've talked about the work that you've done inside that house with respect to processing that house. And all your observations of the evidence and the condition of the inside of that house, other than evidence of the shooting, obviously there's bullet holes and projectiles and blood. Did you see evidence of the, like the classic struggle? Furniture knocked over, stuff knocked off the wall, anything like that? I did not. Now, you originally testified on Friday that you had waited for the Faro scan to be done of that property. Is that correct? Yes. And while you waited for the Faro scan to be done and before you entered that property, did you have the opportunity to check some of the outbuildings around that property? Yes, I did. Mr. Junk, can you put up State's Exhibit A36? I'm going to hand you another stack of pictures if you could. Just kind of take a look at them for a second. Do you recognize those pictures to be a grouping of pictures uh, depicting the work that you did on this case at that residence? Yes, these look like the same pictures I previous, previously reviewed on uh, September the 2nd. I have up on the screen, State's Exhibit A36. 
Can you tell the jury what we're looking at in State's Exhibit A36? A36 is a photograph going basically back to the beginning of the work that we did at 4077 Union Hill Road. This would have been taken from the vicinity that was close to the mailbox located in front of the residence. Does that truly and accurately depict the way that area looked the day that you were out there? Yes. And can you do me two favors? First of all, point to where that picture would have been taken from and then point out is there a building or a garage that is centered at the focal point of that picture? Yes. I would have been somewhere in this vicinity when the picture was taken because you can see the truck in A36. And there was a large building and a outbuilding attached to the back of that. And we're talking about the truck in A36, the silver truck that's depicted in that picture. Again, is that the location you found that truck in the day that you were out there? Yes. And is that truck also depicted or the location of that truck also depicted in that overhead aerial picture that's up for the jury? Yes. Can you show the jury where that is? The garage or the building that is depicted in that picture, as part of your work in this case, did you have the opportunity to process that building as well? Yes. As part of your processing of the building, was it your standard operating procedure to take external photos of that garage or that building as part of just showing how it existed from every angle that day? Yes, it is. And did you do that? Yes, I did. Can I get State's Exhibit A42, please? Can you show us what we're looking at or tell us what we're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A42? Yes, A42 is another photograph from the area closest to 4077 Union Hill Road. It's actually closer to the road, and I'm approaching the residence. You can see, once again, the rear portion of that same silver Ford truck. Okay. Can I get State's Exhibit A41? Can you back me up one? What's depicted in State's Exhibit A41? I don't know if you have that as a picture, but it's up on the screen. Can you tell us what we're looking at there? I do, yes. A41. Once again, I'm moving up closer to that same truck. The ultimate goal would have been to try to document any tag that was on any vehicle. And again, with respect to that truck there, is it the same condition and location it was when you were doing your work out there on April 22nd, 2016? Yes, it is. Can you give me State's Exhibit A44, please? All right. Walk us through what we're seeing here and what's depicted in that picture. A44, I'm moving. If you recall, I testified earlier that when I photographed and walked the exterior of the property, I went in a counterclockwise direction. This would be going in a counterclockwise direction. And, of course, the center of that clock would be where the residence is. And I'm moving around the outbuilding. You can't see it in this photograph, but directly to the left would be where the silver Ford truck would be located. Can you give me State's Exhibit A45? Can you tell the jury what they're looking at in State's Exhibit A45? Yes, A45 still moving counterclockwise. A45 would be a photograph of one of the exterior outbuildings. And in the background, you can see a yellow police barricade tape and actually the residence. Okay. The residence that's depicted in that picture there, is that the residence that you had actually just, or that you were getting ready to, I guess, gone to go through a process? Yes, I would later process that residence. With respect to what was identified or became identified as scene two, in that picture there, as you're taking a picture of that barn, where would scene two be in relation to you with respect to that picture? A general location, if we are looking at A45, if I would turn about 180 degrees and look the other direction, I would be facing somewhat the location of scene two, I believe. And then where on the overhead arrow is that picture taken from? This photograph would be somewhere in this vicinity. Were you between that trailer, that semi-trailer, 
and that garage? Yes. Can you give me state's exhibit A46? Can you walk us through what we're seeing there? Yes, A46, I'm moving uh, counterclockwise around this outbuilding. Uh, you can see that it's two story and uh, the door is, appears to be open and the corner of uh, the residence that we would later process. Can you give me state's exhibit A48? This is A48. Walk us through what we're seeing there. A48, I'm now directly behind that outbuilding and uh, trying to depict uh, the rear portion of this building. There was something significant that we had noticed about this particular outbuilding uh, and we wanted to focus on the upstairs portion as well. Okay, specifically, what was significant that you had noticed? It appeared that there were external uh, video cameras mounted somewhere uh, would have actually been on the other side of the building. This stood out to you as you did your walk around of that, that building? Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A49? A49, uh, that's a close-up photograph. Same general location as the last, but just zooming in on the uh, upper portion of that. You can see the door is open and things inside are exposed. Can you please give me State's Exhibit A50? A50, what are we looking at there? A50, I've moved around now closer to the uh, residence that would later be processed. Uh, you can see the steps going to the upstairs. Uh, over in the right-hand corner of that photograph, in the lower right-hand, you can actually see the front of that uh, silver Ford truck for orientation. Can you give me State's Exhibit A51? Tell the jury what they're looking at there with respect to State's Exhibit A51. Still moving uh, counterclockwise to that building and now you can see the steps that will give you access to the upper portion of the shed. State's Exhibit A52. A52, uh, once again, still moving counterclockwise. You can now see the side of that shed. State's Exhibit A53. And A53, we've now pretty much made uh, full circle uh, and documented as best we could the exterior of that area, the building. After you documented all the way around that building, eventually did you go up and document the inside of that building as well as the, the landing or the, I guess the, the, where the steps went to? Yes. And walk us through how you did that. I uh, started at the bottom of the steps, continued to take photographs as we went up the steps. When we reached the top of the steps, I uh, photographed uh, the exterior uh, of that upper floor, the condition of the door. Uh, there were some remarkable items we found there as well. Can you give me State's Exhibit A104. What's depicted in State's Exhibit A104? Uh, we're getting ready. Uh, what's depicted is a photograph of the, the steps uh, leading up to the second floor of that outbuilding. State's Exhibit A105, just the next picture. Tell us what we're looking at there, State's Exhibit A105. A105, we've reached, uh, nearly reached the top of the steps, uh, getting ready to step onto the deck. If you look, uh, adjacent uh, actually where the deck meets the front surface of the building you'll see a small gray colored door handle lying there that was a point of interest and did you because it was a point of interest did you document it the way you've already testified did you document it take some close-up pictures mark it with an item number and then eventually collect it yes All right. can you give me state's exhibit a106 Again, what are we looking at there? A106, uh, once again, it's a, a little closer to that door handle, uh, and we would <coughs> later assign that handle a number. I'm going to go to State's Exhibit A108. Can you 
you tell the jury what are we looking at there in State's Exhibit A108? A108 is an exterior door handle. Uh, the one we've been looking at pre in the previous photographs, this is an up-close uh, view of that, and it has been assigned item number five. My handy what's been marked for identification purposes at State's Exhibit A490. Can you look at State's Exhibit A490 and tell the jury, do you, rec do you recognize markings on that package? Yes, I do. Tell the jury what that is. This is... Uh, Appears to be my original packaging. It's my original label, has my initials, uh, and it has uh, the description, which would be one handle found on the porch building uh, containing what we thought might be a security uh, camera outfit or DVD in player inside the uh, building. Can you do me a favor? Can you open that package for us? Tell the jury what they're looking at. Yes, this is the original door handle, my item number five, uh, that we saw lying on the, the upper deck on the day uh, that we were. Don't put it away quite yet. So I'm not going to have you walk it through and, and publish it, but if you could just hold it up from a couple different angles so the jury can see it. Was that item collected, maintained, and stored according to your standard operating procedures? Yes, it was. You can go ahead and throw it in the bag for me. And also, while you're doing that, look at that bag. Are there markings that indicate that that item uh, may have been sent to the lab as well? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, we would have another stipulation. I'd like to state your stipulation. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 25. State's Exhibit A490, which is BCI item number five, the door handle uh, from the garage on the property at 4077 Union Hill Road was sent to the lab for DNA testing. There was insufficient DNA on that item for DNA comparison. That's correct. All right, the jury is instructed that the uh, jury is to accept the stipulation just given to be established as fact as fully as if it had been uh, established through uh, evidence here in the courtroom. In addition to collecting that item, did you also examine the door and the area around the door uh, to that part of the building? Yes. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A109? Can you tell us what we're looking at there, State's Exhibit A109? A109, uh, standing on the deck, looking directly inside. Earlier we saw photographs where the, uh, from the ground where the door appeared to be open. We're now up on top of the deck, we're looking directly in. And just to the lower right, uh, out of picture, would be where the door handle was located. Okay. At some point you said you had noticed security cameras on this building. When you were up in that area, did you notice a security camera uh, in that vicinity? Yes. Can you give us State's Exhibit A114? State's Exhibit A114 is up on the screen for the jury. Can you tell us what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A114? Exhibit A114 uh, is you can see the top portion of the door uh, that has been opened, the focal point we've been looking at so far, and then above that is a camera mounted there. We thought it appeared as though it, it were pointing toward the residence. Okay. At some point, did that pique your interest to try to go find a DVR or a recording yes. uh, device that might be linked to that camera? Yes, it did. And did you eventually attempt to do that? We attempted to look for any kind of re recording device that would have maybe documented what happened or given us some idea. Uh, we traced the wires back, they led inside, and uh, we found nothing, no recording device connected to this system. 
before going and looking for that recording device, uh, before going into that, that room, did you examine that door um, a little more further for other evidence or the possibility of evidence? Yes. And as you looked at that door, was there anything remarkable or anything that stood out to you? Two things uh, stood out to me. One is it appeared as though there was forced entry, uh, which would be consistent with the uh, door handle lying on the, the upper surface of the porch. And the second thing is there appeared to be a transfer, a small transfer of blood on the exterior face of that door. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A110? Can you tell the jury what they're looking at in State's Exhibit A110? Yes, A110 is a, uh, it's a kind of an overall shot uh, photograph of the door and the condition of the door handle and the fact that a door handle with the same finish uh, matching the door handle found on the porch is actually missing here. Can you give me State's Exhibit A111? Can you tell the jury what they're looking at in State's Exhibit A111? Yes, A111. Again, it's a closer photograph of what we just saw. You can see, obviously, the door handle is missing. Uh, same finish and uh, collar as the door handle we found. And there also appears to be areas of suspected blood there. That looks like transfer of blood. Okay, and, and describe or explain uh, transfer or why that appears to be transfer of blood. This doesn't look like a, a spatter pattern. Uh, it looks like a transfer pattern. Uh, the difference would be a transfer would be if I had blood on my hand and I touched this paper or something else and then moved it away, uh, I probably would leave blood that I transferred from my hand onto that surface. Did you eventually take steps to identify that according to your BCI numbers and try to collect that blood for further testing? Yes, multiple swabs of blood were taken uh, from that area, the exterior surface of that upstairs outbuilding door, and we did mark those as item number six. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-112? Can you show the jury, or tell the jury, I guess, what's depicted in State's Exhibit A-112? A-112, once again, is a photograph. We've I stepped around to give a better view uh, of the location of the suspected blood on the exterior of the door. You'll see those red spots. We've numbered those uh, item number six, and you can see where those are in relation to where the door handle was missing. Did you testify that you, did you eventually take swabs of that suspected blood? Yes. And did you take it in a manner that you already testified to and according with your training, your experience, and your standard operating procedures for how uh, this type of suspected blood should be collected? Yes, yes I do. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-491. State's Exhibit A-491, do you recognize the markings on that document? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what that is, please? Yes, A-491 is, it's a package. It has my original evidence label. Uh, it's evidence label item number six, and it's two swabs of uh, suspected blood from the exterior door of the building containing this, uh, the security camera. Uh, this package does have my original label and my initials. Does that package also have Markings that indicate that it would have been sent to the lab. Yes. And did you, again, collect, maintain, and store that item in accordance with your training and your standard operating procedures? Yes. Your Honor, this time I believe we have another stipulation. All right. You stated. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 26. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-491, which is BCI number Six, those are the swabs from the stain on the door to the garage, which ultimately, in which ultimately a marijuana grow uh, was found. Those swabs were sent to the lab for testing. That stain, or those swabs tested positive for the presence of blood. 
and the blood contained in those swabs contained the DNA of Gary Roden. Mr. Parker. That's correct. The jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation just given as uh, to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the court. Right, can you give me one more second? Your Honor, there is an additional portion to that stipulation that the parties would like to add. The parties would further stipulate and agree that Chris Roden Sr.'s DNA was not found or was excluded from the swab in that item. That's correct. Right. Again, the jury is instructed to accept the stipulation with the addition just made as having been established um, as fact, as fully as if uh, it had been uh, established through evidence here in the courtroom. Thank you, Your Honor. You're After you were able to document and collect uh, what you believe to be blood there in that your item number six, did you go into the upper area of that garage and document what was inside? Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A? 113, please. Walk us through what the jury's seeing there. We have State's Exhibit A113 up on the screen. Walk us through what the, the jury's seeing in that exhibit. Uh, simply the interior portion you can see in the left area of the photograph, the door that shows you where we are in relation to the things inside. We're still outside. Uh, looking in, you can see uh, insulation. You can see uh, multiple uh, packages in there and a remarkable thing or what we thought would be a, something remarkable were the uh, numerous cables inside on the floor. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-115? Again, walk us through what they're seeing there. Uh, a general overall photograph, just trying to collect anything uh, that might pique our interest later. You don't always know what you're looking for when you move into to a new area, so we just take an overall photograph. You can, however, see a, a storage uh, rack hanging down, multiple things in, in that area, and uh, again, those cables are in the lower portion of the photograph. You said you found those to be remarkable, something that obviously was an area of interest. Is that correct? Yes. And did you uh, continue to move into that area, document, and ultimately collect those cables? Yes. Do those cables appear that they should be connected to something? Yes. Okay. Uh, and again, were you able to run some of those cables out to security cameras? Yes, we were. Did you find a DVR, a recording device, or any other box that should have been hooked to those cables? We found no recording device hooked to those. Everything, uh, we did trace it out to the actual camera itself and back in into that area, but nothing was attached to the other end. Mr. Junk, can you just go ahead to the next picture, A116? Walk us through, can you walk us through what we're seeing here uh, in relation to that other picture as well, the picture we just showed? Yes, I've uh, stepped forward a few steps and now I'm looking to my right. There is a, uh, a small black curtain there and inside there appeared to be a small marijuana grow room. And ultimately, did you go further in there and document that room as well? Yes, I did. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-117? You were talking about those cords and how it looked like they should have been hooked into something. State's Exhibit A-117, tell us what we're looking at there. A117, that's a, an overall photograph of the cords, uh, shows the uh, plugs on the end and uh, where we had traced those two from the camera. And State's Exhibit A118. Again, what are we looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A118? 
just a closer photograph of the same cords and the general area they are located in. At some point, did you spread those cords out a little bit, document their condition, and ultimately give them each cord uh, an item number? Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-135? What are we looking at there? State's Exhibit A-135? A-135, once again, is a, a closer photograph of the particular cords. And State's Exhibit A-136? A-136, we've now uh, tried to separate those uh, to make them easier to package and ultimately uh, for submission purposes. And each BCI item number there, so it looks like seven, eight, nine, and 10, is that each its own separate cord? Yes. And were you able to trace each one of those to a, a security camera that it was plugged into? Uh, the majority, yes. Okay. I don't recall if all four went to a specific camera. Ultimately, did you collect each one of those individual cords? Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-138? What are we looking at there at State's Exhibit A-138? A-138 is uh, the ends of one of the cords, black end and yellow end. We've assigned it item number seven, and the purpose for collecting these, the most obvious purpose would be to hopefully swab those and attempt to locate any DNA <coughs> that might be on those in case uh, a suspect may have removed those from a DVR recorder. And again, even if you swab them, if Andy Wilson is wearing gloves and he touches those, uh, is it likely that uh, the, the gloves will block the transfer of my DNA to those courts? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-492. Can you tell the jury what is State's Exhibit A-492? A-492 is uh, obviously my package. It's my evidence number seven with my original label, my initials, and I've labeled it uh, item number seven, uh, cable. Uh, I put DVR recorder cable from building uh, where the camera was located. Can you open that package and pull out what's inside, please? You don't have to get up, just hold it up so the, the jury can see it. Can you tell the, the jury what that is? Uh, it's, it's my item number seven. It's one of the cables that was found uh, in the area of the building we saw earlier with the camera uh, located upstairs. Okay. Go ahead and put her back in the package for us. As you're doing that, does that package contain markings that indicate that it was sent to the lab? Yes, it does. Right. And that item was it? Collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your standard operating procedures. Yes, sir. You know, I'm going to have a stipulation with respect to this item. All right, state the stipulation, please. Mr. Parker, this will be number 27. The parties stipulate and agree that states exhibit A492, which is a DVR cord from the garage located at 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as BCI item number seven, lab number one. That item was submitted for DNA testing. There was insufficient DNA on that item for comparison. That's correct. The jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation uh, to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established uh, through evidence here in the court. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A-139? State's Exhibit A-139, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, A-139. Earlier we saw a photograph and it had uh, multiple cables, multiple item numbers assigned to those cables. This is a close-up of item number eight, one of the cables. Handy what's been marked for identification purposes 
as State's Exhibit A-493. State's Exhibit A-493, can you tell the jury what that is? A-493, once again, it's labeled as a DVR cable from the building with the camera. Uh, it's in my original packaging, listed as evidence number eight with my label and my initials. And we will need you to open that for us. Can you hold that up? Tell the jury what that is. Yes, this is item number eight. You recognize that as the item you collected that day? Yes, it's the same item that was collected on uh, the 22nd of April, 2016. Was that item collected in accordance with your training, your experience, and your standard operating procedures? Yes, sir. Kept and maintained and stored the same way? Yes. Are there markings on the package for State's Exhibit A-493 which indicate that it was sent to the lab? Yes, there are. Your Honor, at this time, the parties would enter into another stipulation. All right, please express the stipulation. Mr. Parker, this is stipulation number 28. The parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-493 is a DVR cord from the garage located at 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as BCI item number eight and lab number two. That item was submitted for DNA testing and there was insufficient DNA on that item for comparison. Mr. Parker. That's correct, Chief. Again, the jury is instructed to accept the stipulation just given um, to be established as fact, as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A140? Agent Hanshaw, can you tell the jury what is depicted in State's Exhibit A140? Yes, A140 is my item uh, number nine. It's a photograph of uh, one of the additional cables found upstairs. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It's State's Exhibit A-494. State's Exhibit A-494. Do you recognize the markings on that document? Yes, A-494 is my uh, evidence item number nine. I list it as a DVR recorder cable from the building with the camera. It is my label, my packaging, and it does have my original initials. Can you open it and show the jury what's inside, please? What is that item? It's my item number nine, the cable, uh, that we hoped would have been connected to a DVR recorder in the beginning. Okay. Was that item collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your training, your experience, and the standard operating procedures? Yes, sir. Does that package also have markings that indicate that it was sent to the lab? Yes, it does. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. Please state the stipulation. The parties agree and stipulate, and Mr. Parker, this is number 29. Parties agree and stipulate that State's Exhibit A-494 is a DVR cord from the garage located at 4077 Union Hill Road and is identified as BCI item number 9, lab number 3. That item was submitted for the purposes of DNA testing. There was insufficient DNA on that item for comparison purposes. Mr. Parker. That's correct. The jury is instructed to accept the stipulation to be established as fact, as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. Mr. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit A-141? Agent Hanshaw, State's Exhibit A-141. Can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, uh, it's the final cord uh, that we found located in the upstairs of the uh, outbuilding uh, 
A141 is item number 10, which was that cord. My hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A495. State's Exhibit A495, can you tell us what that is? A495 is my evidence number 10. Uh, again, it's one a DVR recorder cable from the building with the camera. Can you open it and show us what's inside? Yes. What is it? It's a DVR cable, my item number 10. Was that item collected in accordance, collected, maintained, and stored in accordance with your training, your experience, and the standard operating procedures you should follow when collecting this type of evidence? Yes. With respect to that packaging, does it also have markings that indicate that it went to the lab for testing? Yes, it does. Your Honor, we have another stipulation. Please state the stipulation. Mr. Parker, this will be stipulation number 30. The parties stipulate and agree that State's Exhibit A-495 is a DVR cord from the garage located at the property 4077 Union Hill Road. It is identified as item number 10, lab number 4, and it was submitted for the purpose of DNA testing. There was insufficient DNA on that item for comparison purposes. That's correct, Chair. The jury is instructed that the jury is to accept the stipulation to be established as fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence here in the courtroom. In addition to collecting those cords inside, did you photograph and document uh, pictures of the marijuana that you found up there? Yes, sir. Can you give me states of <clears throat> A one? State's Exhibit A119, can you tell us what we're looking at there and where in that upper part of the garage was that? Uh, I believe the, this may have been in the, on the left side uh, and it represents uh, a small marijuana grow, uh, in, obviously on the in, interior portion. Did you take other pictures of <clears> that <throat> grow? And make it, well, does that truly and accurately depict the way that grow area looked? Yes. And did you take other pictures of that grow area that day? Yes, multiple photographs were taken. And as part of your work, in this case, or part of your preparation to testify in this case, the other pictures that you took of that grow, did you also initial those, review those, and date those as well? I believe so, yes. And did they truly and accurately depict the way that area looked the day you did your examination of that garage? The ones I reviewed and signed, yes. In addition to that garage, did you have the opportunity to examine other outbuildings on that property? I took a lot of photography of those, but I did not do much of the examination on the interior portions. Okay. Did other law enforcement, were other law enforcement agencies responsible for basically collecting the evidence that was associated with those other outbuildings? Some of those, yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A80. Well, there's a group of pictures. I need to do a group of pictures. Mr. John, can you give me A80? Do you recognize the, the building depicted in State's Exhibit A880? Uh, vaguely, I do, yes. Okay. And do you remember what area of the property that item was on, or that building was on? Yes. Okay. Can you show the jury, please? I believe it's over in this portion of the property. Is that a building that, as part of your work on that day, you helped to document? Yes, I did document that. Mr. Trump, can you give me State's Exhibit A82? And again, can you tell the jury what's depicted in State's Exhibit A, A82? Yes, A82 is a picture, a picture of the uh, same building 
uh, in A81, I believe it, or A80. Uh, just from a different angle, uh, you can actually see in the background that there is a uh, bulldozer, a yellow bulldozer, and be indicated <coughs> over this area, so that would put me here, pointing that direction. Did you also have the opportunity as part of your work to photograph the inside of that <laughs> building? Yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A81? <coughs> Can you tell us what's depicted in State's Exhibit A81? Yes, A81. Uh, obviously, it's just the interior portion of an outbuilding, <coughs> uh, multiple uh, things uh, with in that building, nothing really uh, discernible right now. Okay. When you looked at the garage, you said there were some things that were remarkable. For instance, the handle was on the, the ground, or there was blood on the door. When you looked at this area, was there anything remarkable that you thought you needed to mark or collect at that point? Not at that particular time. Okay. Did you also have the opportunity that day to document another building, a metal sided building, on that property? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as dates exhibits A86 through A92. Can you take a look at those documents? Are those pictures? Yes. Do you recognize that building? Yes, I do. Now, as part of your work that day, did you actually work inside that building or you were, were you responsible for documenting the area around that building? Actually, in the beginning, I uh, documented the area and when I say document, that was uh, by way of photograph. And it was determined at that point, uh, or at some point, I believe that the door to that building was locked and a question of additional search warrants were spoken of uh, and we had to get some clarification. And eventually photographs were taken of the interior. Okay. Did you bypass on and go to something else while they talked about uh, whether or not they needed additional search warrants? Uh, yes, I relayed that information to others. At this point, there are two people working this scene, inside this scene, and two only. Okay. And that's an interesting point. The, the, you talked about how you gear up when you're inside the scene with your tie back and the gloves. The other person that you were working with that day, in every area they were at when they were with you, were they in the same type of protective uh, clothing that you were. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Can you give me State's Exhibit A87? Can you tell us what we're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit A87? A87, once again, is a photograph of the same a building as A86 photograph, but I've moved to uh, one corner of that building. Okay. And the corner of that building, is there, uh, does there appear to be a fan? Yes. Okay. Based on your knowledge of training, your experience, is that consistent with uh, some kind of grow operation? I felt at that point it was consistent with a marijuana grow operation. Can you give me State's Exhibit A88? Okay, again, what are we looking at there? Uh, this is the corner of that building and it uh, kind of highlights the air conditioning system. Can you give me A89? What are we looking at there? Uh, the other corner of that same building. Can you give me State's Exhibit A90? Can you tell us what that is? There appeared to be, at the time, we thought it was some kind of a motion sensor there on that tree. Okay. Later on, when you did your examination of the inside of the, the main residence, 4077 Union Hill Road, did you find a receiver uh, for that? I personally did not. And do you know where in location or where in relation to the location of that metal outbuilding 
is that motion detector? Uh, it was very close to it. Okay. Did it appear that that motion detector was set up to sense movement around that building? That's what we thought at the time, yes. And then can you give me State's Exhibit A92? Can you tell us what we're looking at in State's Exhibit A92? Yes, A92 uh, shows the front door to that building that we uh, assumed would be a grow room. And for documentation purposes, I didn't see any uh, blood on the exterior portion of this door, such as I had when we discussed item number six earlier. And I didn't see any type of forced entry on this particular door. Okay, give me one second. Your Honor, this time the parties have another stipulation. All right. Want to put that on the record then? Yes. The parties will stipulate and agree that with respect to 4077 Union Hill Road and the BCI crime scene evidence collection and examination of that property, none of the evidence collected or examined with respect to that scene contained any DNA that was linked to George Wagner, this defendant, Jake Wagner, Angela Wagner, or Billy Wagner. That's correct. All right, the jury uh, is instructed to accept the stipulation just given as established uh, to be fact as fully as if it had been established through evidence uh, given here in the courtroom. Thank you. So we've pretty much covered, have we pretty much covered the work that you did at that scene on April 22nd, 2016? Yes. A couple, uh, couple questions left for you. Number one, how long were you there at that scene that day? I arrived at approximately 1220. Uh, before that, uh, I'd been at Pike County, uh, or at Piketon, for the briefing, and once again, I arrived at about 12.20, and when I cleared this scene, it was approximately 3.39 a.m. in the morning. Prior to clearing that scene, were you present when the bodies were removed from that scene? Yes, absolutely. Did you actually assist in removing the bodies from that scene? Yes, I did. Any idea... You said you cleared the scene at what, 3.39 in the morning? Yes. Any idea how long before 3.39 those bodies were removed? It would have had to have been within 30 minutes. There was too much evidence between the front entrance and where our victims were uh, to take a chance on moving them out. It was not out of disrespect, but I did not want to lose evidence that could help me determine what happened to them just to simply remove them. And had you completed your processing of the areas that you felt that you needed to process before you allow the coroner's investigator in or a coroner's investigator in and remove those bodies? Yes. Okay. Walk us through that. At that scene that night, 
How did the coroner's office begin to interact with you and what was the process for removing those bodies out of that seat? Earlier, uh, I had stepped out uh, to take a break uh, to drink some water and uh, the person assigned for the uh, coroner's office would have been uh, an investigator that I was familiar with. Uh, talking with him, I told him that I would come get him uh, and let him know at what point we would be ready to remove uh, our victims and he told me that he would he would be on standby until that point and at some point I was ready I did go retrieve him uh, he did suit up we went in all the uh, processing at that point that we could do there would be additional processing but anything that we felt forensically we could destroy had already been taken care of at that point. Uh, from there, uh, we discussed the forensic vacuumings. Those had already been done. We discussed earlier the, uh, the swabs on the, uh, our victims around their wrists and hands. That had already been done. Uh, photography had been done. The wallet had been collected. Everything in that room that we could possibly collect or there in between that we could alter uh, was collected. And from there, we did take our victims, and uh, I always stay with my victims until the time they are released. And so uh, that investigator and myself uh, personally put our victims uh, in their uh, body bags and carried them out personally. Okay. And you talked about you had already examined and preserved all of the evidence. Uh, but again, by that time, you'd already collected those shoe prints is that correct uh, yeah and everything that you had already testified had been collected preserved and saved and now it's just time to get the bodies out and move the bodies out is that yes. correct all right yes. walk us through how how'd you do it how'd you and the investigator get those bodies from that room to wherever they were going and where were they going they were going outside where they would be uh, uh loaded in a transport vehicle and taken for autopsy uh we simply uh, as I said, we, we were planning on going back in that residence. There was still quite a bit more work to do. And so we just, uh, the old fashioned method, we did uh, personally uh, by hand, put them in an individual bag and we personally carried each victim out, uh, one at one end and one at the other. Okay. And with respect to walking the, those victims or carrying those victims down that hallway from the bedroom to the kitchen, or through the kitchen, to the living room, out the door. Did you ever get stuck in the hallway? Was there ever not, never enough room for you to move? Was there plenty of room for you to get those bodies down that hallway and out to those vehicles? Not to my recollection, no. Okay. As part of your work, in this case. Well, let me ask you this. Any idea how many gloves you went through that day? Boxes of gloves. Okay. We got through boxes of okay. And the, the boxes of gloves are they that you use, are they consistent with <coughs> the, the same types of boxes that you've been pulling from in this? I mean not exactly, but as far as number, size, whatnot? A little bigger, yes. But pretty consistent with that, yes. As part of your work in this case, do you create a report of what you've done at a scene? Yes, I do. And tell us how you do that. Uh, we have a system, a reporting system, and uh, we don't have templates, uh, so to speak. When we sit down to author a report, we, we author it based on our notes, uh, based on uh, we use an instrument, uh, it's actually an iPad, but we had a particular program, which is called CrimePad, and we use that to log everything in as we're going through. Therefore, we would have uh, times that things were done. Uh, and ultimately, we sit down and put all of that together and we write our reports, uh, incorporating photographs uh, and as much detail as possible. Do you have a business duty uh, in your role there? at BCI to create and maintain this type of report? Yes. And the report that you created in this case for the work you did in this case 
Was that created in the ordinary course of your duties there at BCI? Yes. Do you have a clean copy of your report with you? Yes. Okay. Can I see that, please? I believe everything is there. What's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A? Can you take a look at State's Exhibit A and tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is a copy of my original report. I actually copied this and brought it with me today. Okay. The original is actually in color, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and again, is that the report that you created for your work in this case? I created this at my home office just in case I needed it for a reference. First of all, the way we walk through your testimony, uh, you remember we covered subject matters, right? So we covered ballistics, then we covered blood, and then we covered, is that the way you necessarily do it or do you go kind of room by room? I try uh, to go room by room so that there will be some type of an organization, uh, not necessarily by, I guess you could say discipline, as far as uh, uh, ballistics or blood, but I try to do it in a manner that whatever I encounter next is what I will try to document and preserve and collect. Uh, if I were to try to take it only biological to begin with, then I fear that I would walk over a lot of ballistic evidence. I may move a lot of things around. Uh, so, yes, when I enter, I try to uh, take the evidence as I find it. Okay. So the way we presented it to this jury might not necessarily be the chronological order that you did things in. Is that correct? No, but it's very close. Okay. And then you had testified that you were familiar with the coroner's investigator that helped you that night with the body. Who, yes. who was that? Investigator Kenny Dick. Kenneth Dick from Adams County. Okay. And do you know, was this... Was this such an extensive scene that, that the locals had to call in folks from other counties to help out really kind of in all levels? That was my understanding. It's my understanding that uh, uh, Kenneth, uh, Investigator Kenneth Dick does that type of work in Adams County, and I believe that he was uh, somewhat on loan from Adams County to Pike County for assistance. You extensively testified about your work with respect to 4077 Union Hill Road. Did you go into any of the other residents that day, that night? Uh, no. Okay. I have nothing further for this witness. All right. Um, I have 17 after 12, so we're going to take our lunch recess. Um, we'll be in recess until... Um, 120. Um, at that time, you need to assemble at the jury uh, room on the first floor to be brought up by court personnel from there to the courtroom. While you uh, are on lunch or session, not to discuss this case with anyone uh, among yourselves or with anyone else. You're not to permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence. You're not to form or express an opinion concerning this case. Um, 
you are not uh, to do any research at all concerning this case from any source whatsoever, whether it be uh, no, resource, no uh, research as to the facts or as to the law. Uh, you're not to read, uh, listen to, or view any reports or accounts of this case from any source at all, and you're to have no contact with any of the participants in the case, including counsel uh, parties or witnesses. Does counsel for either side have anything you wish to say before we recess for lunch? No, thank you, Judge. The only other thing I, I would say is I think by agreement of parties, we're going to substitute a color copy of A for the copy that the witness identified of the memo. That's correct. All right. With that, we are in recess until 1.20.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Um, so uh, we need uh, Agent H uh, Henshaw back in the witness chair. Is that right? Henshaw, if you yes. do that. You're still in direct examination of him. And is counsel ready for the jury to come? Yes. Yes. Right, bring him up. Oh, all right. Okay. And so, uh, the defense may now cross-examine. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. You are Special Agent Hanshaw, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it's probably been a long day and a half or so for you. Appreciate your uh, thoroughness and patience. And answering all the questions. Uh, I do have just a few follow-up questions, if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to start, if I could, just showing you a few photographs you touched on earlier. The prosecutor's assistant press be put up on the monitor. If we could start with um, A41. May I approach the witness, Ron? Yes. Uh, sir, showing you what's been marked previously as State's Exhibit A41. Let's give the monitors a moment to turn on. Okay, um, you recognize that. You took that photograph, right? I think so, yes. Okay, and do you know what that photograph is? I believe it's a uh, Ford F-150 truck. All right, do you know whose truck that is? I don't recall at this time. Okay, it, you can identify it by the license number on the back clearly, correct? The license number can be identified, yes. All right, could you read that, please? Uh, it's uh, George Lincoln George 6077. All right, and if you notice, um, in the bed of the truck, does there appear to be a hard top covering that? Yes. And you took this photo, right? I believe so, yes. And do you need to look at the back of it or anything? Yes, I see. Okay. Showing you A46. This has been marked as State's Exhibit A46. I believe you testified concerning this earlier. Is that right? Yes. All right. And this is a back view 
of the grow room and garage. Is that right? I think so, yes. All right, and at the top you can see the door entrance into the grow room. Is that right? Yes. All right, can you see the door frame there? The white door frame, do you see that? Yes. And showing you State's Exhibit A49. I believe you identified this earlier. Can you take a moment and be sure about that? Yes. All right, and that's a close-up of that same door frame. Is that correct? I think it is, yes. All right, and the door, the hinges, as you look at the photo, are on the left side of the door frame. Is that right? It appears, yes. All right, and so it would lock on the right side of the door frame. Is that correct? It could, yes. All right. Showing you... Uh, a-112, State's Exhibit A-112. If you take a look at that for just a moment, I believe you identified that earlier, is that correct? Yes. All right, and that is a close-up of that same door showing the deadbolt lock on top and where the handle would have been uh, directly below that, is that correct? Yes. All right, and that's uh, your evidence marker number six right there? Yes. All right. And you identified what you thought were three blood stains on that door frame, correct? Or yeah. on the door itself? Uh, yes. All right. Thank you, sir. And when you were inside that grow room, I believe you identified A119. You can take a look at this for just a moment. Make sure that that is your photograph. Yes. All right. And that's, that contains photographs of the marijuana plants, correct? Yes. All right. And those appear to be rather small plants. Is that a fair statement? Yes. All right. Were there any other marijuana plants within that building, or is that all of them? I think there may have been others. Okay. You're not sure? I believe there were others. Okay. Not specifically in this photograph. But. Right. So this is just a portion of the marijuana plants. Yes. All right. Do you have any idea of the number of plants here? I don't know. That wasn't your responsibility to document the number of plants? Not at that point in the investigation, no. All right. Was it at any point in the investigation? Not mine, no, sir. Okay. Thank you. Now, sir, as you arrived, I believe you said a little bit after noon, uh, a few hours after the bodies were discovered. Is that right? Yes. All right. And do you know whether or how many other people entered that trailer, that home, Chris's home, where Chris and Gary were found? Do you know how many other people entered before you did? Uh, not specifically. I know that two officers uh, testified to Ball and Music had entered, and I know that somebody had entered, obviously, that found our victims. But other than that, I do not know. Okay. And <clears throat> when you arrived, and, I, and you testified very clearly about how you documented the exterior of the property going counterclockwise, correct? Yes. All right. Um, did you do that, those photographs of the exterior before you looked inside? I believe I did. Okay. And were you wearing the Tyvek uniform that you testified about when, when you were doing those documentation, those photographs? of the exterior? Most of the exterior I would have been, yes. Okay, let me ask it this way. You arrived, at what point did you put on the Tyvek suit? When I began to approach the house to do thorough processing. All right, was that before you went inside the house or as you went inside? Absolutely before I went in. All right. I was dressed in Tyvek when I did the work on this scene. Of course, and I believe there was one other agent with you, correct? Yes. And he was in a Tyvek suit as well? Absolutely, yes. And his name again, was that Agent Price? Yes. All right. Was he there the same amount of time that you were there? Yes. Was he inside the trailer when you were inside the trailer? Not always, but most of the time, yes. Okay, so there were two of you inside that trailer for a large amount of the time that you were documenting the evidence? Yes. All right. Did he take any photographs? He may have taken some photographs. I'm not, not sure. Okay, but the ones you have identified today are the ones you have taken. As far as I know, yes. All right. Do you know if he collected any evidence different than what you've shown the jury so far? I know he did not collect evidence any different. Okay. 
and I'm sure that you were very careful as you moved about the crime scene for all the reasons you've given. You didn't want to disturb anything, correct? Uh, previously, I said I know that he did not. First of all, uh, on that particular day when we worked together, I know that he did not. And yes, we did move very carefully within the residence. Right. Uh, now, when you arrived around 12, a little afternoon, I think you said 12.20 or so? Yes. Um, that's obviously in the middle of the day, correct? Yes. All right, do you know if there were any interior lights that were turned on when you arrived? I don't recall. So at the time of these murders, you don't know what the lighting conditions were like inside the trailer, is that fair to say? I don't recall. It seems uh, as though they were not on, but uh, that's that's a hard thing to to remember and give an exact answer to. So I, I don't recall uh, if anything in the living room was on or not. For the bedroom. Yes. For the kitchen. Yes. Now, once the bodies were removed, I think you said that was probably around three o'clock in the morning. Is that fair to say? Somewhere around that that time. Yes. Okay. Once those bodies were removed. You left the scene shortly thereafter, is that right? Yes. All right. Did you ever return to the trailer yourself? I did not. Uh, prior to leaving, I had a, a discussion with my supervisor, and I indicated that obviously things would, somebody needed to return, whether it me or another agent. Uh, if you recall, uh, uh, BE 13.0 in the floor, we had not gotten underneath the residence yet. Um, there were many, many things that needed to be done. However, we did need to get that evidence uh, to a facility to where we could get started processing it. And so it was understood that somebody would come back, but it was not me. It was not you. Yeah, I had other obligations, and I had to unfortunately go take care of those things, other case obligations. Sure. Now, you testified earlier today about <clears throat> the broken eyeglasses and the lens that was out of the eyeglass, correct? Yes. Uh, is that a classic sign of a struggle or a fight in your opinion? In this particular case, I didn't think it was. You did not think it was? No. <coughs> now, you were very careful uh, at the scene and even here most of the time in handling the evidence with, uh, with gloves, correct? Yes. What type of gloves were those? I believe they were uh, latex glove. Right. And why do you use latex gloves? Actually, I wear those because they were the double thick gloves, uh, less, uh, less possibility of any kind of transfer. They actually fit my hands. I have large hands. And the reason for wearing gloves at all is a, to attempt uh, to keep from transferring any DNA to anything you're working with. And certainly, if I were wearing example, let me give you a hypothetical. If I were wearing a cloth glove, do you know what a jersey glove is? Yes. What's a jersey glove? Uh, it's one of the brownish gray small cloth gloves. Kind of a work glove? Used for a work glove, yes. Yeah, kind of a work glove. If I were to wear a jersey glove and I dipped my hand with the glove into water and then I touched a doorknob, what would you expect to find on the doorknob? <coughs> I've never, I've never tried that. I don't know. Well, would it surprise you if the doorknob is wet from the water? It, yes, it could get wet. All right. Same thing with blood. If somebody has a jersey glove on and they touch blood, it could transfer to a doorknob or to a door. Would you agree with that? It could, yes. Likewise, if I were to put two gloves on, if I took a bare hand and put a jersey glove on here, and then took the gloved hand and put another jersey glove on the other hand. There could be DNA from my skin on the exterior of that jersey glove. Is that right? It's possible. And that could transfer to an object I touch. Is that it correct? could, yes. Now, these diagrams are very helpful, but I do want to ask you a question or two if I could. Now, just showing you what was previously marked as State's Exhibit 545, the biological evidence. You remember this, correct? 
Yes. All right. Does everybody see this? Okay. And at the top, and I think you testified, this was prepared but not to scale. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And what does that mean, not to scale? That means if a grid were laid out on that paper and a measurement was taking, taken of a, uh, a building, for instance, the uh, drawing on the paper, if it's not to scale and not laid out perfectly on the grid, would not necessarily uh, give the correct exterior dimensions or a wall dimension. However, it would show uh, a, a rough example of what what you're trying to document. So not to scale wouldn't be, not to, uh, to complete exact measurement. Right, were there, were there exact measurements made in the interior of the trailer? So, uh, it depends on the uh, 3D scanner, and I did not work with the scanner. All right, but there were no other measurements taken? No. What about on the outside of the trailer? Were there any measurements taken? No. Now, a little while ago, just before lunch, you testified about state's exhibits 7, 8, 9, and 10, which were the cords that you found up in the grow house. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. All right. Did you find any evidence of blood on those cords? I did not. Did you collect the cameras that you had photographs of on the outside of the grow room? I did not collect those cameras at that time, though. No. Now, there was a picture in Chris's bedroom of a large gun safe. Do you remember that? Yes. And the handle on that, correct? Yes. Now, when you were in that room, was that safe open or closed? I believe it was closed. All right. Did you ever open the safe yourself? I, I did not. Was it opened in your presence? No. Now, you had very thoroughly documented the two victims in the bedroom where the bodies were found, correct? Yes. All right, as you stand, as you stood at that doorway from the hallway into the bedroom near the safe, right? Yes. All right, as you're looking at the bodies, would Gary's body have been the furthest away from the door? Yes. And then Chris's would have been closest to the door. Is yes, sir. Correct? Yes. In, in your opinion, does that mean that Gary was placed in the room first? It appeared that, that Gary was dragged in there first and then Chris was later dragged in. Now you're certainly aware, aren't you, that the trailer was eventually transferred into a storage facility. Are you aware of that? Yes. Do you know how long the trailer remained on that piece of property before it was placed into storage? I do not. Showing you another aerial photograph, State Exhibit 544. I'm sure you remember this. Is that right, sir? Yes. All right. You did not take this aerial photograph, did you? I did not. No. But it's an accurate depiction of the scene at uh, 4077 Union Hill. Is that right? I believe it is, yes. Okay. If I could ask you to hold that so the jury can see it. And then, so I just want to point out a couple of things here. Now this is an aerial photograph and this is Chris's trailer right there in the middle, is that right? Yes. All right, and there are numerous cars, trucks, different automobiles scattered about this property, is that right? Yes. All right, did you have any responsibility in uh, documenting any of those vehicles? Actually, I did take uh, photographs, as I stated earlier, of the vehicles in order to try to uh, capture their registration numbers. Uh, according to my report that uh, was submitted earlier, I actually did uh, apply fingerprint powder to some of the vehicles in an attempt to locate any uh, partial fingerprints or anything of that nature in this vicinity in case somebody touched that as they were entering or exiting. And did you submit those fingerprints for analysis? Uh, I didn't find, I didn't locate anything. You did not locate anything? Yes, I did not. Okay, you attempted to find it, yes. but you did not find it. I did not find it. All right. Now, earlier you identified a pickup truck with a hard top on it, on the bed. Do you remember that? Yes. Would that be this truck right here where my pen is pointing? I think it is, yes. Okay. 
and that's this area here there's the main road right this is union hill road right here yes all right and then there appears to be a lot of dirt roads or dirt driveways or paths throughout the property is that right yes all right when you were documenting the exterior of this property walking around this property did you document these dirt driveways for any tire tracks i actually looked physically uh or i looked visually to see if i could find anything uh, physical any kind of physical evidence uh, footwear or tire tracks and did you find it i didn't okay and to the right as you, as we're looking at this photo to the right of the truck with the hard top on the bed there um, do you see a red pickup truck nearby i think that's yes to the right here yes all right is there any other red truck in this vicinity here Okay, when you say there, that's over towards Frankie's, right? Yes. Quite down the dirt path, pretty far away from the trailer where Chris was found, correct? Yes. Okay. Are there any other red trucks that you know? That may be a truck there. Okay, that's or even Frankie's. further away towards Frankie's, is that right? I believe so, yes. All right. Any, uh, any other ones, sir? I don't see any. I can have just a moment, Your Honor. Sure. Thank you very much, sir. I have no other questions. Any redirect? Just redirect. Mr. Hanshaw, I put back up for you and for the jury what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit A547. Again, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, it's a uh, not to scale drawing of the residence of uh, Christopher Roden. Do you have your pointer? Yes. All right. Do me a favor, point to where you found that lens that Mr. Parker talked to you about, that eyeglass lens. On that area. Okay. And when you were in there processing that scene, were you able to see that lens there on the floor and in relation to where that blood was? Yes. Okay. And you heard the stipulation. Well, let me back up. You actually took a swab somewhere up in this area. I believe it was swab number 20. Your, your item number 20, uh, you took a swab of that blood, is that correct? Yes, I did. And why did you take a swab of the blood in that area right there? As I testified to earlier, there was an accumulation of blood in that particular area. And what I, what I mean by an accumulation of blood, if you were to cut your hand and you were to stop in one spot, stand there for five minutes, and then move, there would be more blood in that spot than there would be anywhere else. And at that point, I felt like the accumulation of blood in that spot was most likely where that bloodletting event had occurred. That's also where I found the lens and item number 20 uh, was the blood of Gary Roden. Okay. And when you say bloodletting event, that's, a, that's a, your, your type of term, right? Yes. That, that's yes. a, not a scientist, but a, a CSI guy type term, yes. term, correct? Yes. Okay. In layman's term, is that where somebody fell and laid why they bled? Yes. Okay. And that blood, again, as it stood out to you as being pooled there, was right next to an eyeglass lens. Is that correct? Yes, it was. And you just testified that that DNA on that blood right there belonged to Gary Roden. Is that correct? Yes. And throughout the investigation, 
And did you also learn that Gary Roden wears glasses? Yes. Okay. When you looked at that, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, and your analysis of that scene, were you able to draw any opinions with respect to where Gary Roden fell after being shot? That location where the lens, item number 31, that's where I thought he fell. Okay. That's where I thought it occurred. Okay. Consistent with being shot and fallen as opposed to a struggle, as Mr. Parker asked you about. Is that correct? Yes. There was nothing else in the area that indicated a struggle. And that chair here, this chair here, it wasn't flipped over, flipped back, opened up, or anything like that, correct? Yes, that is correct. And as you looked at that chair, no discernible blood or anything like that on that chair. Is that correct? No. Now you did say, or you, did you testify that it did appear that that chair had been moved or canted or pushed? Is that correct? I felt that the chair had spun around uh, because uh, BE 13.0, which is ballistic event or bullet hole in the floor, uh, that we looked at earlier, it was partially being covered by the corner of that chair. So in order to find BE 13.0, we slid the chair back around and then it was made obvious. And BE 13.0, was that actually up like in this area here? Yes. Can I use your pointer? As you testified on direct BE 13.0, it had, it had blood stains around it as well, correct? Yes. And as a matter of fact, did you testify that those blood stains had a sweeping pattern that actually moved and linked up with or were, became consistent with this drag mark right here? Yes. Did you also take swabs of the blood from that area? I took two swabs, uh, item number 18 from that area on the floor. Also took two swabs, which was item number 19, which was up on the wall from that area near the deer head that we looked at in the photos and those were examined. Okay. And those were sent for DNA, is that correct? Yes. And do you remember whose DNA was on that by stipulation? Christopher Rodin. All right. Now again, was that BE13 and that blood right there, the, uh, the trajectory or the, the angle of that hole in the floor, did that make it appear to you that that shot had been fired from inside that residence? I can't give an exact trajectory or angle, but it was from inside the mobile home, out through the floor, down underneath the house, and it was in a fairly uh, vertical trajectory. As if it had been fired down, correct? Yes. Now, as part of the work in this case, you said other agents came in later, is that correct? And, yes. And did some of the stuff, like dig that bullet out? Yes. And would they have used rods and, and tried to get a better look at the trajectory on that hole? Yes. Now, with respect to the blood that was Christopher Roden's right there, again, were you able to follow that blood trail to this area right here? There's a break in it, but were you able to make that, that path or determine that path? Yes. And you talk about bloodletting events and the hole in the ground, the, the, the projectile hole, ballistic event number 13, Chris Roden's blood right there and those drag patterns. Based on all of that, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, were you able to form an opinion as to where Chris Roden would have fallen or been shot on the floor? Absolutely, yes. And where was that? This area. And that's ultimately where he would have fallen and had, had a bloodletting event, is that correct? I believe that, yes. Did you also, I think you testified to this, around this front door area, were there indications of multiple bullet shots with wood chippings or wood shards coming through that door? Yes, that would have been BE 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And 5.0, 6.0 was the one in the door. As part of your work in this uh, case, again, uh, did you uh, take every measure necessary to protect that scene, specifically 
these shoe prints that you saw in there from being corrupted or being in any way altered. Yes. And were those shoe prints pretty much readily available, or not available, but perceptible by you when you first looked into that trailer? The majority of them were, yes. Okay. Additional footwear was found once inside. Okay. And based on your initial peek into that trailer or that residence, is that when you said, hey, I don't want to do anything else until I get a Ferris scan? Yes. Did you, you finished up early morning hours, 3.40 in the morning. Was this scene then held or frozen so that other work could be done on it? It was absolutely, yes. I spoke to my supervisor and was adamant. Uh, it didn't have to be. Uh, it would have been done, but I, I had to hear it. I wanted to make sure that it would be what we refer to as being held. In other words, deputies or officers will be posted at the scene and no one would be coming in because it's still an active scene. And was that scene held for quite some time in this investigation? Yes, it was. And ultimately, was it held until those trailers were removed and taken somewhere else off-site? To the best of my knowledge, yes. I'm not sure. Thank you. Any additional cross? No, thank you very much. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Is the uh, state raid call another witness? Yes, Your Honor. You may do so. We would call Agent Todd Fortner. solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer unto God. I do. Be seated. My name is Todd Fortner. Can you spell your last name for the court reporter? F-O-R-T-N-E-R. -E Where do you work? At the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. What do you do for the Bureau of Criminal Investigation? I'm a special agent currently assigned to the Special Investigations Unit. Uh, at the time of this incident, I was assigned to the Crime Scene Unit. 
I want to talk a little bit about your law enforcement career and what you've done to get to your, your current position. Tell, uh, tell the jury, when did you start in law enforcement? I began the police academy in the fall of 1994, graduated in January of 95, uh, was employed as a reserve uh, officer later that year until 96, uh, and then I've been a full-time law enforcement <coughs> officer since then. So where did you go to the academy at? I went to Hawking College. And where did you get your first job as a police officer? The village of Asheville. I worked oh. there for, I'm sorry. No, good. I worked at the village of Asheville as a year, a year as a reserve, uh, and then three years full time before going to the Pickaway County Sheriff's Office. I worked in the jail for a year and then worked patrol and investigation. Came to the Bureau in 2011 um, for the first 10 years or so, nine and a half, 10 years, I was assigned to the crime scene unit. And then since then, in the last year and a half or so, I've been in the special investigations unit. What did you do when you were with the, uh, the village of Asheville? What, what was your job? What, what kind of duties did you have? I patrol officer. All right. Answer 911 calls, do routine patrol, that kind of stuff? Yes. And then you said you spent the first year in the jail or in corrections? Yes, I did work in corrections for a year at the county, at the sheriff's office. And at Pickaway County Sheriff's Office, is that just the way it worked? When you came in new, you started in the jail? Generally then, yes. Uh, after you got out of, uh, after you got out of jail, after you uh, <laughs> got out of corrections, what would you do for the Pickaway County Sheriff's Office? I worked in the patrol division uh, almost exclusively for the time I was there. Uh, I did assist in, with investigations toward the end. And when you said assist in investigations, were you assigned as a detective or would you just from time to time get called up to help out? I would just be called to help. It wasn't a permanent assignment. What year did you go over to BCI? 2011. And your initial assignment in BCI was? Crime scene unit. Talk about that. When you come into BCI, what kind of training? We've already, we've already talked about, we've had witness talk about what you have to do to get hired. What do you have to do when you first come to get trained to do the job? Well, in particular, in the uh, crime scene unit, there is a lot of training. Uh, basically, it's a very technical, very specialized uh, unit where we do a lot of uh, forensic, scientific things. Um, I received over 1,000 hours of advanced law enforcement training uh, just in the first few years. Uh, I was sent to the National Forensic Academy, which is at the University of Tennessee. Uh, it's a three-month in-residence course uh, on all aspects of, of crime scene processing and uh, uh, forensics. Is that, called, is that called the body farm? Is that what the the body farm is located there, yes. We, and what, what do you do at the body farm? What do you do down in Tennessee when you're a student there? Um, a little bit of everything. At the body farm itself, we did spend a week or two uh, excavating, exhuming a, a body. Um, but then we also, for the rest of the 10, 11 weeks, um, we did a week of shooting incident reconstruction, a week of bloodstain pattern analysis, photography, several other things. And were you able to successfully complete that training? Yes, I was. And have you also received advanced training or certification in um, becoming an evidence technician? Yes, through uh, the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy, um, there's a, a couple courses with a curriculum of different classes that you need to take. Uh, I took those and became uh, certified as a master evidence technician through OPADA and as I also went the track and was certified as a uh, master criminal investigator. Along the way, have you, uh, have you obtained your degree? Yes, I have a bachelor's degree in criminology and psychology from Capital University. Take us through, once you uh, became employed, once you did your, your training, where were you assigned? within BCI, was there a certain region that you handled, certain area that you handled, and how would you uh, work cases in that area? Yes, I worked, um, at first we were divided, crime scene was divided into four units throughout the state. I was first assigned to actually Southwest, but that quickly 
then transferred to Southeast because of where I lived. Um, then at some point, just a couple years in, we combined those to just a north and a south crime scene unit. So we worked 44 counties in the southern half of Ohio. And what do you, you said you did that until about a year ago? Yeah. And what do you do now? I'm in the Special Investigations Unit, um, handling, uh, you know, serious crimes, investigations when requ requested for assistance, crimes like murder, rape, officer-involved shootings, that type of thing. Still assigned to the southern half of yes. the state? Southeast, yes. Southeast. Along the way, does BCI require you to go to continuing training or continuing education? Yes, the, uh, I mean, the, the training that the Ohio Peace Officers Council, Training Council sets forth as far as uh, continuing professional education, uh, we meet all those requirements uh, and additionally go to other investigative courses. And throughout your career, have you received advanced training in specialized areas such as blood stain or blood pattern analysis? Yes, uh, over 100 hours, about 168, I believe, in blood stain pattern analysis. Um, over or around 100 in shooting incident reconstruction. Um, I've had both basic and advanced courses in both those, as well as at our office to be able to do those higher level uh, reconstructions like shooting incident or blood stain pattern. You have to go through a mentorship process and an in internal uh, verification that you can do what you can do. Um, and I did complete that, and I was certified by BCI as both shooting incident reconstructionist and a blood stain pattern analyst. Have you also received specialized training or certification in operating tools that help reconstruct or document crime scenes? Yes. In addition to the basics like photography, um, we have measurement devices, uh, a total station is a, a laser transit used uh, like in surveying. We use that to, to measure distances and then um, we eventually did get a hold of 3D scanners. Okay. And what kind of training did you have to go through to learn how to operate uh, a 3D scanner? You go through a certification course, uh, usually from the manufacturer. So I know at one point we uh, originally had a Leica machine, and I had to go through the Leica training, uh, and then we then purchased Faro machines. And I went through the Faro training, and I was certified as an operator through Faro. Any idea how many hours of training you have to go to to become a Faro operator? At least 24, maybe 40. Were you able to successfully complete all of that and become a certified Faro scanner operator? Yes, I was. I want to take you back to April 22, 2016. Uh, what area of BCI were you working in that day, and where were you assigned? I was in the crime scene unit assigned to Southern Ohio. At some point on April 22nd, 2016, were you called out to assist Pike County with an investigation? Yes, I was. Walk the jury through that. How did you get notified? How did you get called out? Where were you? How do you typically get called out on these cases, and where were you ordered to report? So we typically... Uh, work from home or work out of our homes. Uh, so I was called at home by my supervisor, Gary Wilgus, at the time. Um, he advised there was uh, a case here in Pike County that the, the sheriff's office was requesting our help with. Um, they said it was a uh, multiple victim murder case and that basically almost everybody in my unit was, was going to respond. We were uh, ordered to come to the Piketon Police Department, City Hall, um, which is where we staged and came together for a plan of how we were going to do it. Okay. Walk us through that. You get that call, you respond. Now, do you have, you said you worked out of your home. Did you guys have specialized vehicles or something that were assigned to you? Talk the jury through how that worked. Yes, in the crime scene unit, we have uh, the crime scene trucks that you may have seen on TV uh, with all of our equipment in it. Um, we keep those at home. They're assigned to us. So were you able that morning just to go out, hop in that truck, put your uniform on or your, whatever your uniform at the time was, and hop in that truck and go? Yes. Okay. You get down here to Piketon, walk the jury through the process of once you got to Piketon, how did you figure out who was going where, who was doing what, what the plan was? Well, we 
we kind of got a briefing on what all they knew at the time. Uh, at the time, we knew there were um, seven victims at three different locations. Uh, so we began to divide those locations up and assign a lead investigator from crime scene to each location and then a support person as well. And at some point, did you get assigned to a scene? I did. And what scene did you get assigned to? I have a scene at 4199 Union Hill Road um, that was later designated as scene two. So once you get assigned to scene two, uh, what do you do? Do you have an assistant or somebody who's helping you out at that scene? Were you the lead? I was the lead at that scene, yes. Right. You, who was your assistant? Uh, Special Agent Ed Hunter. So you and Special Agent Hunter get assigned. What's your next move? So we come up with a plan of, you know, how we're going to, to do it as far as what equipment we had and what we needed. For instance, the Faro scanner, um, not everyone in the unit had one or was an operator. Um, so we were going to have to overlap and, and take care of some things at multiple scenes with, with equipment such as that. Okay, so walk us through that. Back in 2016, because, uh, well, were you a Faro scanner operator back then? Yes, I was. Okay, and because you were a Faro scanner operator back then, did you have one assigned to your truck or in your possession? I did. Okay. And at some point, did you get requested to help out do Faro scans at other scenes? Yes, I did. So walk us through that. How did you, once, once it was decided that Faro scans were going to be done on the scenes, what was your first move with respect to leaving Piketon and going to do whatever you had to do with Faro scans? Well, we, went, we first went to our scene, uh, okay. 4199, which was right next door to 4077 Union Hill, which was scene one. Um, I got a briefing from the deputy that had been holding that scene as to what had happened you know, what he had done so far. Uh, and then we had word that the search warrants were signed and we were able to go in and, and investigate the scene. Um, we did a walkthrough, decided to uh, scan the interior of my scene. Uh, Agent Hanshaw was next door. He was the lead at, at scene one, 4077. Um, he requested that I come over and, and scan his scene because he did not have a scanner assigned to him. Okay. And did you do that? Did you go over and help Agent Hanshaw. Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, again, is is Agent Hanshaw pretty particular about uh, how he likes his scenes to be handled and whatnot? He is very meticulous. Okay. Yes. And would he have, when you showed up to his scene, did he brief you on what he had at his scene and what evidence to watch out for and be careful of? Yes, he and did. not disturb. Specifically, I remember he pointed out um, a bloody shoe print that was just inside the door that he could see um, and made me aware of that so that I would avoid that area. Okay. And again, he's pretty particular about his tie back. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. And if he would ask you to suit up and tie back, you would have followed his request and gone in and tie back. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Yes. So walk us through how, well, walk us through what a Faro scanner is. What, what is a Faro scanner? and how does it work? So it is a, a laser scanner. So um, basically it's similar to, if you can see at, at home improvement stores now, they have laser measuring devices uh, that shoot a point from one wall to the other and tell you how far it is. This does basically that same concept. The difference is this has a rotating mirror uh, that reflects the laser and then the whole unit rotates on a tripod and in about seven minutes' time, we collect uh, approximately 44 million points in measurements. Okay. Then it also goes through after it takes those points and uh, takes photographs that it then overlays on the points to colorize the points to make it look a little more like, you know, what, what you saw. Walk us through the logistics. Well, first of all, how big is it? Does it come in a box? How do you, when you get it out of your truck and you load it up to a scene, how are you doing that? What do you got to do to assemble this thing and get it ready to go? It is a box. It's probably um, maybe 12 to 18 inches long, maybe 12 inches wide once you take it out of the case. Um, and that head sets on a tripod. 
and basically you take it out, you set it up, you get into the machine and set certain parameters. How far do I want the laser to shoot? Am I indoors or outdoors? You know, that type of thing. Um, and how many points we want it to collect, whether we're just doing a very rough, quick scan to get major points or whether we're doing a more detailed scan where it will collect more points but takes longer. Um, and then you set it where you want to be, make sure it's fairly level, although it does have a self-leveling uh, feature. Uh, and then basically you turn it on and let it run, let it scan. And walk us through, how do you typically approach a scene that you know you're gonna scan? And you start outside, move inside, do you start inside, move outside? How do you decide how, what strategy you're gonna use to scan a, a scene that you're required to scan? That can depend and it can vary um, based on where evidence is located, um, you know, access to your scene. But as a general rule, we work outside in. And do you take multiple scans or do you move the machine multiple times yes. as, you, as you go through a scene? Walk so it, it, is, it is shooting a laser beam that is straight and has to be line of sight. So anything that can't be seen, for instance, you know, if there's a void behind something, it won't pick up any points there. In other words, to get voids around a, uh, an object, you would have to place the scanner at different areas around the object to make sure you're hitting all sides of it. So it's a pretty standard practice to move it around yes. so that you're getting all aspects of a scene that you want to scan? Yes, it is. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes at State's Exhibit 544. We'll put it up for the jury here. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. All right, State Exhibit 5, A544 that we have before the jury. Can you tell the, the jury, do you recognize that area? Yes, I do. Um, this is the area of, this is scene one or 4077, Union Hill Road, and this is just the end of my scene, scene two at uh, 4199. If you would, walk us through, where did you make your way down to at scene one, 4077? Where did you hook up with Agent Shan Hanshaw, and where did you start the process of uh, doing your uh, ferro scan? Yeah, so from here, I, I believe I just pulled down the road here and got my equipment out. Um, met with Hanshaw right here in the front yard, Discussed. He briefed me on what he saw and what he had um, and where we should probably start scanning from. Um, and we went from there. Okay. Walk us through. What do you remember about scanning that scene? So I know we, we scanned, uh, we did one scan from outside, out front, where you could see kind of the whole front yard. Uh, there were bullet holes in the front of the trailer that were then uh, subsequent, subsequently we placed trajectory rods in and to measure those we placed spheres on those rods that then the scanner can pick up um, to measure our angles. So I did two scans on the porch to make sure I got all the measurements I needed on those spheres. And then we began to go inside. Okay. And I'm going to walk you through later on I'll walk you through specifically because can you specifically with the Pharaoh's machine use it to help determine trajectory of projectile strikes yes absolutely okay and ultimately did you end up doing that in this case at, at a later time yes we did okay I'm gonna come to that later we're gonna talk about the general scan right now all right okay so did you set up and scan out front yes I did all right. and walk us through how does the scanner record what you're doing and then how do you go back in later and look at it and gather data or information from it? So it, it records basically what we call a point cloud. All these points that it measures, that it shoots all around it um, are in one big cloud that we then take back and put in software. We can stitch those together uh, and it, it will tell us within a, a certain tolerance um, how they're aligned, and if, it, if it's outside of the tolerance, we obviously have to continue to try and line it up. Um, and then you can use that data to um, colorize it. We can create 3D models out of it. We can do measurements from it. And ultimately, is that done through a software package? Yes, it is. And then how 
do you access that software package and ultimately bring it to court so a jury can see it? So there are multiple ways. Uh, we can Once we get the point cloud together, it is what it is. There's no manipulating that. Uh, we, we may go in and clean up some of the images. Uh, for instance, when the scanner, if a laser beam hits the edge of something, edge of a table, let's say, um, we can get what we call a skip, uh, where it'll, it'll shoot a point, but it basically puts it out in space where it skipped off that corner. Uh, so we can go in and clean some of those out. Uh, usually I can't get them all, but just to make it look a little cleaner. Uh, once we get all that done, we, we, in essence, lock it so that that's the data we're using, but it, we're not going to be able to change the data, just put it in different formats. Um, we can put it into a 3D world where we can go in and walk around in that world and show you. Um, we can do a fly-through video that will just, you know, be like basically a short movie uh, flying a certain path throughout that scene. And again, even though you can go through, well, you said it, it can track or take up to 44 million points? Uh, prob probably more in the more detailed, but yeah, that's our standard was about a seven minute, 44 million point cloud. Okay. And you talked about some scenes you do short or quick if you just want to measure from point to point, and other scenes, scenes are more extensive, is that correct? Yes. What was this? This was more extensive. Now, the, we wouldn't do the, the like, limit of the machine. That's basically reserved for like a very small area of just something you want perfect detail of. Um, if we did that on an entire scene such as this, it would have taken days. Okay. Uh, but still, when you set up for this scene, uh, are you getting enough points that you can accurately make the measurements that you need to to accurately document this scene? Yes, absolutely. And are you also able, through the machine, doing it the way you did it that day, to get the video or the pictures, I guess it's pictures, right? The pictures that you need, again, to accurately document how the scene looked. Yes. Did you, in preparation for this trial or your testimony, did you put the Faro scanner work that you did with respect to this scene on a thumb drive that you can access in court? Yes, I did. Okay, and did you bring that with you today? Yes, I did. Do you have your computer up there? I do. All right. Now, does this software take some pretty good computing power to actually run it and make it work? In its raw form, yes. It takes a, a specialized computer that, um, you know, we had to purchase with the machines. Um, it just takes a, a tremendous amount of memory, a tremendous amount of processor speed, um, and graphics. I see that. Yes. already plugged in up there. Probably going to have to plug it in. Yeah. 
An available outlet. Okay. Am I in the right one? Yeah. Is it this cord or this one? It was. We may need to shut down and restart it. Okay. Try that. Nothing yet.
measures that says it doesn't detect it. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. What I need you to do is you got to talk loud because we pulled you off the mic. So you got to make sure you're projecting to the jury. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at? Well, first of all, you, you testified that you originally set this up out front of 4077 Union Hill Road. Does the image that's up on the screen truly and accurately depict where you would have initially started your scanning process? Yes, it does. Walk the jury through uh, what they're seeing, what they're looking at right there. So this is the front of 4077 Union Hill, the trailer there, um, in the front yard. Uh, there's some vehicles, there's a mower deck here on the ground. Do a whole 360 there, okay. Now, again, does that area that you just did that 360 of, does that truly and accurately depict the way that that area looked the day that you were out there? Yes. Okay. And again, is that consistent with what you know the Faro scan captured as part of your work in this case? Yes. All right. Is another tool or technique or, or thing that you can do with this is can you measure, can you make measurements from this software uh, that were recorded by the Faro scanner? on the day that it made the measurements. Yes, so what we're looking at, though it looks like a picture, actually is uh, the photos that it took, but they're overlaid over all of those points. That, by contrast, I can show you, uh, this is just the points that have been colorized. So there's no photographs here. Uh, so I can measure between any one of those two points. Okay. If you would, keep coming in that direction. All right, I'm gonna have you stop right there. So. For the jury's purposes, could you take a measurement? Can you see the bush hog or the mower that's right there? Yes. The, uh, the empty area, the grass, where the grass is kind of not growing as well, can you measure from that area to the front door using this system? Yes. Can you do that for us? Is this point good enough right here? Sure, perfect. Just the door? Uh, sure, let's go to the front door. Tell us, what's the distance there? 33.338 feet. Just over 10 yards? Yes. Okay. If you could, turn us back more towards the door so we can see the front door of the... Okay. You talked about cones. Are the cones... Uh, are not the cones, but the spears that you put out there on that day, are those visible in that picture? Yes, they are. And what do those spheres represent? 
So those are among the trajectory rods. The, the rod runs through the center of the sphere, and the machine knows, uh, and the software knows how big that sphere is. They're, they're ordered from the company, they're very precise. It can find the center point of that sphere if we can get enough points around the sphere for it to recognize it. If you put one at either end of the rod, it will then measure those center points between them, and that can then be extrapolated back to uh, show the trajectory of the, of the uh, projectile. Can you take another measurement for me? Yes. Can you measure, just pick center mass, I guess, on those spheres. Measure from that sphere right there. We'll just pick that one right there. How high that is off of that, the wood of that front deck, right in there. Approximately 3.484 feet. Okay. All right. In addition to setting the scanner up and scanning outside, did you also go inside of the residence there at 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes, we did. Okay. Walk us through how you did that, how you said, well, first of all, again, when you went into this residence, were you extremely careful not to disturb any of us? Yes. Okay. As you walk through the front door into that residence, walk us through, well, what are you seeing? First of all, when you walk in there, what do you, what do you observe? Tell the jury what your observations are, what you're able to see. Um, well, first at the door, there were, I observed bullet strikes um, here at the beginning of the porch, as well as several strikes around the door area that Agent Hanshaw had already marked uh, and showed me when he briefed me on the scene. Okay. And eventually you go in and walk us through uh, what you see inside that door. That's so... Oh, did you scoot, shoot another scan? I'm from sorry, I just went for another scan, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Walk us through each one of the scans that you did. So the next scan you okay. did, was, was that up on the porch as well? This is on the porch. Again, you can see these spheres. Uh, and they're kind of bunched together there because there were several bullet holes very close together. So I had to take a couple different angles to make sure I got enough points on each one of those spheres. Okay, well, back us up to the one you just did. I'm sorry. And I want you to do the same thing that you just did. Very slowly, do, give us a complete 360 so the jury can see the way that porch looked on that day. All right, stop real quick. From that, yeah, from that angle right there, I want to point out a couple things. Can you see, can you see what I'm, can you see the screen? Yes. Do you notice a gray or a silver truck that's in the driveway right there? Yes, sir. And again, does that tree then accurately depict the way that that area looked on that day? Yes. And then also, the gentlemen who are in this driveway area, do they appear to have protective suits on? Yes, they do. And what are those? They appear to be tied neck suits. Okay. Continue to work your way around for us. Go ahead and take us to the next scan that you did. I'm going to have you do the same thing very slowly. Work your way around that porch so the jury can see the way that area looked on that day. Go, do me a favor, go back to the left. Oh, oh, right there, at 15. Tell the jury what they're seeing there with respect to that. Uh... There were bullet strikes in this wood that was laying here. Uh, I believe there was still a projectile, if I'm not mistaken, in the wood that uh, Agent Hanshaw marked as an item. Okay. Now, is the next scan that you did an inside scan? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to need the, the press not to, not to record this one. Can you take us inside to that next scan, please?
Okay, and where inside the residence is this scanned from? This is just inside the front door. You can see here's the, the front door. Uh, we're in the living room right behind this chair. Okay. Uh, again, when you walked into that residence, were you able to see uh, what appeared to be blood drag, drag marks on the floor? Yes. And are, are those depicted in that picture? Did the scanner pick those up as well? Yes, they are. Okay. And also, were the footprints, can you see the footprints there at all? Or? Yes, I believe they're in this area. Okay. Can you back us out and go up closer to the inside of the door? Right in there. All right. Can you show us again where there are ballistic events that had been at least stickered at that point with respect to around that door? Yes. Okay. And walk us through and, and can you back up? Can you measure? Why don't you measure from the top one down to the bottom of the floor? Or is that chair in the way there? Move over and get an approximation. So I chose this point on the uh, switch plate because it is on the same plane as that. Uh, door jam. It's 3.416 feet approximately. Also to the left of the door on the wall by the deer head, are there other cones uh, and trajectory rods that you put up as part of this? There are. Okay. And can you walk us through? Uh, I, let's go to another angle. We'll, we'll look at that from another angle. What I need you to do is take us through a 360, a slow 360, so we can see everything from, uh, from this view. You lift it up a little bit. There you go. Okay. Go ahead and take us to the next view, if you would. If you would just stop right there. Again, under the, the deer head that's depicted in that picture, uh, are those cones, what are those, I keep calling them cones, those spheres, what do those uh, represent? Yes, they are on a trajectory rod that is into a bullet hole um, that appears to come through the doorway over there. Okay. And can you measure the height of those from the floor for us? Do you have the ability from this view to measure the depth of that residence from the front door to the back wall? Approximately 13.076. Is that feet? Yes. Okay. And just like the other view, can you give us a nice, throw, nice slow 360 degree view so we can see that entire area? Let's stop it right there for a second. What are, explain to the jury, what are these things right here? Bubbles? Yes, the bubbles. Uh, so each of these little balloon looking things is a scan position. So where I would have placed the scanner and, and done a scan, each one of those balloons is where it would have been. Okay. So go ahead and take us, finish that 360 degree. And if you would, move us to your next scan position.
Where are we at here? We're in the kitchen. This, Same. Um, this is the hallway back to the bedroom. All right, stop right there. Again, the ferro scanner catching that blood trail that goes back to that bedroom? Yes. Okay. Continue to scan around for us. Go ahead and give us the next point. Give us a 360 degree of that. I'm going to have you stop right there. I'm going to ask a couple follow-up questions. The Ferro scanner, uh, did you testify that it's on a tripod? Correct. Okay. And are you setting this tripod up so that it's not in any way, shape, or form impeding that blood trail or getting in that blood trail? Yes. And as you're moving around in there doing that scan, or are you moving around? Do you just set it up and how, how do you do it? How do you? Yes, so the, the scanner will pick you up if you're in the vicinity of it. Sometimes we walk outside, sometimes we can hide around the corner, but you just do what you can to try and not be in the, in the scan. Okay, and as you are, again, moving around to that scene, are you avoiding that blood trail and that blood evidence in, in that scene? Yes. Right. I want to talk about this hallway back to the bedroom. Eventually, do you make your way back to that bedroom through that scene? Or do, do scans from back there? Yes. Okay, and are you able to go through that hallway without disturbing the blood drag marks at all? All right. Can you do me a favor? Can you just step out and step so the jury can see you? Okay. The size you are today uh, is, uh, well, how, how, how tall are you? I'm six foot six. And how much you weigh? And north of 300 pounds. Okay. <laughs> Back in 2016, all right, were you that same size? Probably, yes. Okay. Were you still at least six foot six? Yes. You haven't shrunk since 2016. Right. Yes. And we're back in 2016, were you still north of 300 pounds? Yes. Okay. On April 22nd, 2016, uh, were you able to move yourself and whatever equipment through that hallway without disturbing that effort? Yes. Okay. Did you ever get stuck or hung up on anything? No. Okay. Ever bang off of anything or crash anything or knock everything over? No, it was as wide as a standard doorway because there was a door at the end of the hall. Okay. And still, even though you're six foot six, north of 300, you could maneuver back and forth in that area. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Thank you. You have a seat. So if you could. We're gonna do the same thing here. Uh, let's do a 360 all the way around real quick. Not real quick, but go nice and easy. All right, if you could take us to your next scan location. Where are we now? We are at the entrance to the bedroom. And I'm going to have you do the exact same thing, orient it so the jury can see, and then give us a 360 degree scan. Nice and easy. Is this the door leading into that bedroom? Yes. Okay. And again, when you set the tripod up there, are you avoiding blood or contaminating or disturbing any of the evidence? Yes. All right. Walk us through, give us a 360. Did you do more scans back in that bedroom? Yes, there are two more. Can you walk us back to those? So 
nice and easy. And again, were you able to make it back to that spot to set up your scanner, uh, even though you were six foot six and north of 300? Yes. Okay. And then one final scan. If you could just give us a nice, easy 360 there. All right, I'm going to ask you to do just a couple measurements, and I don't know what scan will be easiest for you to get to, but can you give us the distance from the front door of 4077 to the start of the blood trail by the, the rocker recliner? Six, two feet. Okay. Can you give us the distance of that drag mark right there to Chris Roden Sr.'s body in that back room? You may have to do it in segments. That's fine. Just make sure you're tracking that one. Okay. Can you come a little bit to the left for us there? Oh, that, that scans. Are you still going to go into that back bedroom? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I thought you were done. Okay, so that first one <coughs> was, it's approximately 32 to 33 feet total. Okay. And can you do the same thing for the, go back to the, the living room for me. And come left, that pool of blood right there. Can you track that one? back to the location of Gary Rudin. Okay. So again, you're looking roughly 32 feet right now, that area. Okay. Okay. After <coughs> you and the other crime scene investigators, well, after you finished doing the Ferris scan this day, yes. did you go back? and process scene two? Yes, I did. Okay. And eventually, do you finish processing scene two? Yes, I do. And 
At some point, was there a follow-up meeting where all the crime scene agents and investigators came together to talk about next steps? Yes. Okay, tell us about that. Do you remember when that happened or where that was? I know we initially talked that evening. I believe it was around midnight by the time we quit for the night. Um, it was dark out. We weren't able to see to do any more things outside, really. Um, we'd been there a long time. So we made the decision to hold the scenes with security there, with the sheriff's office uh, securing the scenes, and then come back at a later time to do any more uh, searching or processing that we wanted to do. And clearly, some scenes were a little more simple from an evidence point of view. Is that correct? Yes. And some were more complex. Is that correct? Correct. And did it take some agents longer to finish scenes than other agents? Yes. Okay. So at some point in the next couple days, uh, do you all meet up and, and come up with a plan for what you're going to do? Yes. And what was some of the information that you had received? Did, did the agents who had done each one of the scenes, scene one, scene two, scene three, did they come and share what they had found from a ballistics point of view or from a, a blood point of view? Did you guys basically have a powwow and, and kind of share information? Yes. Okay. And at some point, um, was there information that caused you to want to go back out to some of these scenes and, can, and keep processing? Yes, we knew that we were going to return um, for instance, the, the safe in this scene needed to be opened, but by midnight, 1 a.m., calling somebody out to try and open the safe would have been implausible. So uh, we knew we were going back to do some things, but yes, we received more information to kind of guide us towards um, some other things we were looking for. Okay. Was one of the things that you wanted to do at this scene, 4077, was a trajectory or ballistics reconstruction of those shots. Yes. Okay. Walk us through um, what you did, <coughs> how you did it, and kind of what the plan was. So basically, um, you saw where the, the spheres were on the rods. You can generally get an idea that they were downward, that they were coming from the outside, from the, the front yard area. We know that because of the wood on the porch that was struck. So we knew it had to be at least that far out. Um, and then we used measurement data, including distances, angles, taken by the scanner. And we were able to cal calculate a trajectory, back extrapolate a trajectory to where we believe the uh, shots came from. Okay. i tell you what I'm going to have you do at this point. This nope, I'm going to have you unhook. So you talk about the trajectory analysis uh, with respect to the, those front holes in the door at 4077. Is that correct? Correct. All right, I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit S1A. S1 little a. And it's straight on, no cones. All right. S1 little a. That I handed you, is that the same image that's up on the screen over there? 
Yes, it is. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to that exhibit and how you got to that point or how you did that analysis? Yes, based on the angular measurement data, we take the horizontal angle, the vertical angle, um, and this is just a line drawn between those two spheres, a straight line that then can be extrapolated back to um, a possible origin of those shots. Okay. And do you take, again, several different views of that area? Yes. And based on the data that the ferro scan was telling you, uh, was it believed that those shots that went through that front door came somewhere from the area just behind that bushel? Anywhere between that area and the first strike in the porch, yes. I mean, handy what's been marked for identification purposes states exhibit S1 little b. This is overhead with no signs. States exhibit S1 little b that you have in your hand. Is that the same image that's up on the screen? Yes. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? So this is an overhead view of, of those same trajectory lines uh, that were done on a computer, um, showing the, from the top down, we see the horizontal angle. And again, based on the data collected from the angles of those bullet holes in that front door area and your laser scanner, uh, is it predicting that those shots originally came from that general area where those lines are at? The shots could come from any area along those lines. Okay. What we do know is there are strikes in the front of the porch, so it had to be at least there. And where these lines end on the ground is approximately um, where, where the, the trajectory lines end on the ground, so it couldn't be any further back. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So, because it's dealing with trajectory and angles, if I'm laying down on the ground, it would originate from where those lines end. Correct. But I guess I could be standing or kneeling somewhere in between. Is that correct? Yes. All right. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as states exhibit S1 little c. S1 little c is from side, no cones. S1 little c that you have in your hand, is that the same image that's up on the screen? Yes, it is. And can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a, a side view of those trajectory lines, and here we can see the vertical angle, the downward angle coming from the, the holes back to the or origination. Okay. Now, based on that information, that trajectory analysis that you did with respect to those shots in the front door area, yes. were you interested in trying to find shell casings or anything else that would link where that, those shots were fired from? Certainly. Yes, and I know uh, Agent Hanshaw, night one, uh, spent a great deal of time searching for any casings out in the yard there near the porch area. So when we came back, we also uh, continued to search because it was odd that we found no casings. When it was uh, the, the number of shots and the size of the, the projectile we saw led us to believe that it was a, a rifle round um, and not a single shot, which means it should have ejected casings. Um, when we came back uh, the second time, we, Agent Hanshaw had used uh, visual methods and metal detectors. We also used metal detectors and we brought in two bomb sniffing dogs, one from the State Fire Marshal and one from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms that are trained to detect explosives, which they can smell the gunpowder uh, from casings or even on weapons and we've had a lot of success um, finding those that way. Okay. On this day that you came back out to do this trajectory analysis, Mr. Jump, if you could give me, give me the overhead of no cones. I'm gonna put up state's exhibit S1 little b. In spite of the metal detectors, in spite of the bomb sniffing, firearm casing sniffing dogs, uh, were you able to locate any shell casings in that area right there that were associated, that you believe to be associated with this case? Not a single one. Okay. Give me one second. Your Honor, I'm getting ready to switch topics with this witness. I don't know if 
You want to take a break now? Uh, well, we we can. Do we know? We have some idea about how long the witness will. We, if I drove him straight, we could probably be done at four o'clock. Well, I, I don't. I don't know. That. I actually, I don't know. That. I don't know how long we're going to be. With him. Well, if you think there's a reasonable <laughs> chance to be done by four o'clock, with if you go straight, then I would say. The jury may prefer to just go on to. I, I don't know. I, 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 you know what? The second I say that, we'll be here at 4 30 and I'll still be asking right. questions. All right. Let's, we'll take a break. We've been at it for a while. So we'll take a 15 minute break. I have uh, 3 13. So th at 3 30, you need to be back at the jury room to be brought up here by, uh, by court personnel. Do not discuss the case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit the case to be discussed with you in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning the case. Do no research at all concerning the case, either as to the facts or as to the law. Uh, do not read, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case and have no contact with any participants in the case. With that, we are in recess until 3.30.
you. Be seated. Is counsel for each side ready for the jury to be brought back in? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. All right. Said five or six more times. State of Ohio may, may uh, resume direct examination. Thank you, Governor. All right, when we left off, you had testified about going out to 4077 on a follow up <coughs> examination. So far, talked about doing trajectory analysis, is that correct? Yes. And then, based on that trajectory analysis, looking around that property for shell casing, specifically shell casings that may be associated with a high power rifle. Is that correct? Correct. All right. In addition to those two things, on your follow-up work out there, were you also directed that you needed or did you know that there could possibly be a projectile or a bullet underneath that trailer? Yes, Agent Henshaw had uh, told us there was a, a hole in the floor and he had marked it, I believe it was BE-16, if I'm correct. Okay. Um, I'm going to... Show you what's been marked for identification purposes, States Exhibit A467. You're actually going to have to look at the TV over there for this one. Okay. All right, State Exhibit A467. Again, does that appear to be in the general location of the projectile strike that Agent Hanshaw had pointed out or told you about? Yes. Okay. And could you go ahead and give me State's Exhibit A468, which is the next one? Again, does that truly and accurately depict uh, the way that bullet strike that Agent Hanshaw pointed out to you with respect to there may be a bullet underneath the trailer? Yes. And can you give me A469? Okay, and you testified that you thought it was bullet, a ballistic, uh, ballistic event 16. Uh, put I put State's Exhibit A469 up on the screen. Does that refresh your recollection with respect to what that ballistic? Yes, event it was, was ballistic event 13. I apologize. Okay. Now, when you went back out there to do that follow-up work, walk us through how did you try to determine the trajectory that that projectile may have been going when it went through the uh, the, the floor there? Well, first. Uh, we note that this is an entrance hole, uh, the smooth margins around the hole, a bit of a shoulder. Um, 
So we believe that was an entrance hole going down into the floor. So the next thing we need to look for is a second point or the next point that it, the bullet may have struck. Okay. And at some point, did you actually use rods to try to determine the angle that that bullet may have gone through that floor? Yes. And prior to just now taking the stand, have you had the opportunity to review your pictures that you took out there on that day that you were doing this follow-up work? Yes, I did. And did I show you state's exhibits N1 through N45? Yes. And do you recognize those pictures? Yes. And what are they? They are pictures of um, the floor, the trajectory rod, and um, underneath the trailer subsequently. Where the, with respect to state's exhibits N1 through N45, were there also pictures of other work that you did out there that day? Yes, there were pictures of um, the opening of the safe and the recovery of items from there. Do you also have the opportunity to look at the back of those pictures, or at least take a peek at the back of those pictures and notice the initials ATF and then a digital or, or a number associated with that? Yes. Okay, can you tell the jury, what, what is that? What are those numbers or letters, number, combination? The uh, serial number that the camera gives each photo um, goes to 99.99, so 10,000 photos basically, and we use our, our initials before that so we know whose camera was used, who took the pictures. My full name happens to be Aaron Todd Fortner, ATF are my initials. <laughs> so those would have all been taken by me or with my camera. Okay, and the cameras that, even the pictures that were taken with your camera with respect to the work on that day, would you have been at least in pretty much close proximity where you've been able to observe or been briefed on what uh, pictures were taken? Yes, I would have been there. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. As states exhibits N1, N2, N is in November, I'm sorry, N3, N4, N5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So basically, the state's exhibits N1 through N13. Can you take a look at those? And Mr. John, could you put state's exhibit N1 up on the screen? Could we be uh, Oh, yeah. Let's do it this way. I'm going to take this one. So N1 has digital number ATF 2914. Can you tell the jury what you're looking at or what they're looking at with respect to state exhibit N1? Yes, this is a picture from floor level with a trajectory rod put through that bullet hole um, to show the angle. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as state exhibit N2, which is digital number 2915. And Mr. Junk, I'm just going to keep going. State's Exhibit N2, is that the same image that's up on the screen? Yes. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, again, this is a, a photograph of the angle of that trajectory rod down into the floor. Okay, and when you're talking about angle in, in the floor, again, what is that, what's that telling you with respect to where that bullet was fired from? You said you had an entrance hole, you can now tell the angle, is that, is that picture or is that analysis starting to tell you a story about where that shot may have been fired? Yes, it's a fairly steep downward angle. Um, so the muzzle of the weapon was fairly close um, okay. over top of that hole. Okay. So something down like so. Correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N3, which is ATF 2916. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there with State Exhibit N3? Yes, this is a, a photograph of that hole with a trajectory rod, and we have cut the floor above it there, cut out what we call a window, um, just made a hole in the floor nearby so we can see into where that would have went. And does that help you basically track the path of that bullet through the floor into where it goes next? Yes. And as you look through that window in that picture, did it help you determine where that bullet may have traveled. Yes, it did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N4, which is 2918, ATF 2918. 
State's Exhibit N4 that you have in your hand there. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at? Yes, this is just a closer picture of BE13 um, with the trajectory rod through it. State's Exhibit N5, which is 2919. Is that the window? It is. Right, can you do me a favor? Could you? We can do it from there. Show the jury where that hole is in that picture. The hole is right here. Okay. And did you stick the rod through and track the trajectory of that hole yes. underneath that window? Yes. My hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, state exhibit N6. N6 is 2920. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a, a photograph through that window in the floor um, into a second strike on a floor joist there underneath that hole. State's exhibit N7, which is ATF 2921. Well, actually, before you, hold on a second. Can you actually see a rod in that, uh, in that picture? Yes. Okay. Point to the jury to show them uh, where that rod is, that trajectory rod. And what we've done is uh, a second hole was found here, and the rod then will extend downward through that hole. And did you find, again, that second hole to be in line or in trajectory with that first hole that you had stuck the rod in? Yes. The original, when the rod was sticking out of this hole, it was also connecting with that hole. Well, did you just push it all the way through, or did you have somebody come push it all the way through? Yeah. Okay. I'm handy what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N7. seven on the screen. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there with respect to state exhibit N7? Yes, this is a close-up photo of that uh, that hole in the joist uh, with the rod going in through it. Were you able to track it, track that hole through that joist and then down underneath into the uh, uh, underside of that or beneath that trailer? Yes, we were able to track it down into the ground. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N8, which is 2923. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there with respect to State's Exhibit N8? Yes, this is a photograph under the trailer. Um, you can see that rod through the holes extending down to the ground. And again, we, I'm going to hand you, I'm going to skip to N10. State's Exhibit N10, which is... 2925. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a closer view of that um, extension of the trajectory rod down into the ground underneath the, the trailer. Once you were able to follow that trajectory down into the ground, at some point, did you send somebody on there, there to dig around in the dirt to see if they could recover a projectile? Yes. And who did that? Agent Josh Durst. Okay. And were you there assisting him and helping him as he did that? Yes. My handy what's been marked for identification purposes, the state's exhibit N11. Can you take a look at that for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Give me the digital number on the back. 2927. Can you tell us or tell the jury what they're looking at there? Um, yes, this is a photograph of the from the rear of Agent Durst um, climbing under the trailer and tracing that rod to, in an attempt to locate a projectile in the ground. At some point while he was under there, did he indicate to you that he was able to find the projectile that was associated with that ballistic event? Yes, he did. And did he bring that out from underneath the trailer for you? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N12, which is digital number 2928. State's Exhibit N12 that you have in your hand, same image that's up on the screen? Yes. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? This is a 
picture of the projectile that was recovered from under the trailer by Agent Durst. And I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N13, which is digital ATF 2929. N13, is that the same image as up on the screen? Yes. Okay, when Agent Durst brought that projectile out from underneath that trailer, did you have the opportunity to kind of look at it and examine it? Yes. What did you notice about that uh, projectile? Or what uh, did anything stand out to you? It was a hollow point. Um, appeared to be a pistol projectile that had not expanded. Okay. And talk about that. So, with respect to uh, hollow point or, or rounds that have uh, you know plastic tipping in there, what is the uh, or plastic inside the hollow point? What is the purpose of that uh, plastic? Uh, tipping and what is the purpose of a hollow point and how does it work? Some hollow point bullets um, don't have that plastic, but they can have. It just stabilizes it a bit more. Um, basically, the way a hollow point bullet works is um, a softer substance, human tissue, is designed to go in and expand those metal petals out in order to create a, a, a larger wound track. Okay. And with respect to this projectile, that Agent Durst showed you on that day, was it expanded out like it had been through soft tissue? It was not. I need you to pile a quick load on this one. Okay. show you what's been marked for identification purposes of state's exhibit N46. Do you recognize the markings on state's exhibit N46? Yes, these, um, it's evidence number 60. It states it is a jacketed bullet from the dirt under the trailer. Okay. And it was collected by me. All right. And ultimately, uh, when Agent Durst hand you that, did you take that into custody and mark it, package it, maintain it, and store it in accordance with uh, your standard operating procedures? Yes. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you open that item? pulled out a little package that has markings on it. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, these are markings that would have been placed on it in the laboratory by a firearms examiner. Um, it has uh, the lab number 16-15195. Could you do me a favor? Could you pull that item out? Can you tell the jury? what it is they're looking at with that item? Yes, this is that um, jacketed hollow point bullet that was recovered from under the trailer. Okay. All right, request permission to publish this. Objection. No objection. Put that back in the plastic wrap for me. Or the plastic bag. And again, with respect to the fact that it's not expanded out, does that indicate to you, based on your knowledge of training, your experience, that that didn't hit like soft tissue uh, or 
whatever causes that span. I guess it's soft tissue, fat, muscle, human, yes. uh, human's flesh. Yes. Yeah, so the that cavity is designed to expand with a liquid, basically, which is what happens to, to flesh, to to soft tissue um, when it is struck at that velocity. If it hits something hard, for instance, wood, concrete, um, potentially even uh, bone, uh, before hitting enough of a quantity of um, soft tissue to expand, it will basically just dent the front of it and it will keep going and it will basically become a, a non-hollow point projectile at that point. Okay. So it's the liquid nature of the skin, flesh, fat, or whatever that causes that expansion. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Again, was this, well, let me ask you this. The, the markings on that package, again, does it indicate that ultimately that went to the lab? Yes, there's a sticker on it uh, with lab item number 73 with the lab number 16-15195. And when we talk about the lab, do you have a firearms examination section over there at the lab? Yes. And you have scientists over in that lab who specialize in looking at projectiles like that and comparing them to other fire projectiles. Yes. In addition to the trajectory work, in addition to looking for shell casings, in addition to digging that bullet out from underneath the trailer at 4077 Union Hill Road, did you also help participate in a search of a safe on that day? Yes. Okay. Tell the jury where was that safe, describe it, and what did you have to do to, to try to get into it? It was a large standing stay, safe in the bedroom. Um, I believe at first we contacted a locksmith um, to come out and attempt to get into it, but he was unable. Um, we ended up calling the fire department to come out with the jaws of life and pry the safe open. Were you eventually able, or was somebody eventually able to get that safe open? Yes. As part of your duties there, did you document that safe both before and after it was opened by BCI? Yes, I did. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N14, which is ATF 2930. Can you take a look at State's N14 for me? Can you tell the jury is State Exhibit N14, the same image that's up on the screen? Yes. And tell us what's depicted in that picture. That is a photograph of the safe, the top half to a third of the safe, um, in place before we attempted to gain entry. State Exhibit N15, which is digital picture 2931. Can you take a look at that? Can you tell the jury what is depicted in State Exhibit N15? Yes, this is a photograph of the bottom half of that safe then, prior to our gaining entry. In 16, which is digital image 2932, can you tell the jury with respect to N16 what they're looking at there? That is after the fire department had uh, deployed their hydraulic tool uh, and pried the, the door from the frame. And once they were able to pry it open like that, were you eventually able to pull that door all the way off and examine the contents of that safe? Yes, we were able, able to pull it open. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, a state's exhibit in N34, which is 2950, ATF 2950. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? This is a photograph of the interior of the safe once we got the door open. And did you, once the door was open, did you document the different shelves in the different area of that safe, areas of that safe? Yes. My hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N19, which is ATF 2935. Can you tell the jury what that is? This is the top shelf of the safe. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. There, you can see there are, uh, there are U.S. currency on the top uh, as well as other items. State's Exhibit N20, 
which is digital picture 2936. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at there? Yes, this is a photograph of, of the gun rack and lower shelves on the right side of the interior. Today's exhibit N21, which is ATF 2937. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at there? This depicts the bottom uh, shelf and the bottom of the gun rack with long guns. State's exhibit N23, which is ATF 2939. Can you tell the jury what's depicted there? Yes, this is another picture of the, the left side of the top shelf. And as you were opening the safe and, and documenting and starting to clear it out, did some stuff kind of fall out or were you removing stuff and, and stuff ended up on the floor? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N30, which is ATF 2946. Can you tell us what we're looking at there? Yes, there are some items on the floor that, that fell out of the safe. Um, you can see uh, cash on the floor as well as some just inside the safe at the bottom of the long gun rack. And ultimately, did you collect the items or some of the items that were in this safe? Yes. And was money one of the things that was collected? Yes, it was. And do you remember how much money was collected? We did not count it at the scene. We released that to the sheriff's office, but I believe I heard later it was over $20,000. Okay. And ultimately, was that amount of money deposited in, a, in a, an account here for safekeeping and holding as evidence? Yes, I believe they put it in a safe deposit box at the bank. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N32, which is 2948. State's Exhibit N42, can you tell us what's depicted in that picture? Yes, it shows uh, again that cash on the floor as well as there's a, a handgun in the photo on the floor that had fallen out of the safe. Did you also, as you went through, find identification documents? Yes, we did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N35 which is digital picture ATF 2951. Can you tell the jury what that is? It is the, there's a wallet that contained the driver's license of Christopher Don Roden Jr. And as you, again, collected items from that safe, did you find a small amount of drugs in the safe as well? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N38, which is digital fic picture 2956. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, there are baggies uh, that contained a, a white substance that appeared to be drugs. And again, was that collected as part of your work as evidence in this case? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N36. Did you also find other identification documents? Yes. That is digital picture ATF 2952. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a Social Security card for Gary Dwayne Roden. Let me back you up real quick on that last picture. State Exhibit N38, which is ATF 2956. Okay. The drugs that you point out, the baggie of drugs, where's your point? Can you point to that, of course? Right here. Next to the baggie of drugs, was there also a baggie of what appeared to be dry rice? Yes. Okay. And again, with respect to that dry rice, did you find any drugs or anything like that in the dry rice? I don't recall. Okay. Yeah, you can hold okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N37, which is ATF 2953. Can you tell the jury? What's depicted in that? 
It is the Social Security card for Clarence Franklin Roden and Ruger Lee Roden. Did you collect, obviously there was pictures of guns in that safe, did you collect and mark those guns uh, as evidence in this case? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N39, which is ATF 2957. Can you take a look at that for me? Yes. Can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, there is a revolver, a semi-automatic handgun, and a carbine pistol. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as state. Well, first of all, were those guns that were found in the safe? Yes. Okay, and were those guns that were collected and taken into evidence in this case? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State Exhibit N40, which is ATF 2958. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? Yes, this is a photograph of um, long guns taken from the safe that we collected. And again, did you itemize each of those, give them a, a unique BCI number, and take them into evidence? Yes. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit N41, which is ATF 2959. you take a look at that for me? Can you tell me what that is? Yes, it's a closer view of um, some of those long guns taken from the safe. And were those collected as evidence in this case? Yes. Give me one second. In addition to the items pictured, the guns and the other items collected from the safe, did you find a GPS tracker in that safe? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit N48. Do you recognize the markings on the package of State's Exhibit N48? Yes. Can um, you tell us what markings you recognize? Yes, there's one of our evidence stickers um, stating it is evidence number 86, GPS tracker, uh, correct, collected from the bedroom safe. And again, does it have you as the agent identified as the person who collected that, submitted it to evidence? It does, and it has my initials on the seal. You have the scissors back there, Agent Panshaw. Like to open this. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Do you recognize the items inside that package? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury what it is uh, that you pulled out of that package? Um, these are pieces of what is believed to be uh, a GPS tracking device. And again, was that an item that you pulled out of the safe as part of your work there at 4077 Union Hill Road? Yes. Okay. You can go ahead and put that back in for me. Does that, does that have markings on it that it went to the lab? Um, I do not believe so. Okay. Thanks. In addition to the GPS tracker and the other things that you talked about, were there various miscellaneous documents in that safe that were ultimately collected as evidence in this case? Yes. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Defense may cross examine. Thank you. How are you? 
Good. How are you, sir? Good. A few follow-up questions, if I could. I'm John Parker. I represent Mr. Biden over here. Let's start where we kind of ended. If I could name an item to this one. Uh, are we able to do that? The photos you just went through? That's, all the photos are up there. So okay. the way to do it would be to look at the photo and give you the digital number on the back. That's fine. Just a few follow-up questions concerning some of these photos. Did you take these photos you just identified? I either took all of the photos or I took most of them, and one of the other agents could have taken them with me there at the scene. Okay. It was with your camera? Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at State's Exhibit N40, which I believe has ATF number 2958. Is this one of the photos you just identified, sir? Yes, it is. Okay. And is, are those the long guns or the long rifles that you seized from the safe that you just talked about? Correct. Is that all of them? I believe so. All right. Do you know how many there are there? Um, not off the top of my head. I do not. Okay. But they're all pictured there. If we could count them, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe 16? Does that sound about right? At least. At least. Do you know what type of long rifles those were? Yes, there are rifles, there are shotguns, um, there are some bolt action rifles, lever action rifles. All right. And did you make a list of everything that was seized from that safe, an inventory? Yes. All right. And those would have been listed with some detail in that inventory? They would have been listed on the inventory, yes. Uh, showing you State's Exhibit N39, which is ATF number 2957. Do you see that, sir? You just identified this a few moments ago, is that right? Correct. Now, there are three, I guess those are handguns, is that right? Two are handguns. One is uh, a carbine handgun. Okay, let's take them one at a time if we could. I'm not a gun person, so I apologize for my ignorance. But in the lower right-hand corner, there appears to be a white-handled revolver. Is that correct? Correct. Do you know the size of that revolver? I do not. All right. Would it be, if, if one looked at that pistol, had it in its hand, would you be able to tell the size of it? It should have markings on it, yes. Okay. But they're not readily discernible from the photo, is that right? Correct. Okay, fair enough. Now, just to the left of there, there's another gun. What yes. kind of gun is that? It is a semi-automatic pistol. And what is a semi-automatic? It's for each time you depress the trigger, it fires one cartridge, ejects the casing, and loads another cartridge to All prepare right. to fire. And that's different from the revolver next to it, correct? Correct. Can you tell the jury the difference, just so we're on the same page? Revolver has a cylinder that drops a hammer on each individual, individual cartridge to fire, and then the cylinder rotates to the next. And the casing would stay inside the Correct. revolver? Correct. It right. would not eject it like a semi-automatic would? Right. Okay. Now, there appears to be a large gun above that. Yes. What is that? It's, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with these weapons a lot, but uh, what they would call a, a Tech 9 or a Mac 11, um, they can be converted to full automatic. And what does a full automatic mean? Um, it will continue to fire cartridges as long as you hold the trigger. All right. And do you know, like, the maximum uh, capacity, capacity for the cartridge in that top weapon? Um, it does not appear there's a magazine in that weapon, so whatever know? the capacity of, of the magazine you put in there. Okay, so it does not have a magazine in it at this point. Right. But you could put one in there. Sure. And what size do those magazines come in, if you know? Um, 20, 30, 100, All right. multiple. All right, so let's say it's a 20 uh, capacity magazine. You'd put the magazine in, hold the trigger, and it would fire 20 with one pull of the trigger? It could, yes. And the same if you use the larger magazine? If this were converted to, to full auto, yes. yes. They do make semi-automatic versions. Fair enough. And do you know the size uh, of the, or the caliber of the bullet that would be fired from that? I do not, okay. from this picture. Right. Fair enough.
And the cash that you talked about a moment ago, did you say it was more than $20,000 cash? I believe so, but I did, I did not count it. Would that be listed on the inventory somewhere? Inventory would list that there was cash taken and turned over to the sheriff's office. So somebody else would be responsible for counting it? Yes. But you're familiar with the results of that, and it's over $20,000. That's what I'd heard, yes. Okay. Now, let's back up a little bit. Um, approximately what time did you arrive on the scene? Um, approximately 1.50 in the afternoon, I believe, at my scene. Okay. Um, it would have been earlier at, in Piketon. Sure. So what time did you arrive at the home where you did the scan that you just talked about? 1.50 p.m., I believe. About 1.50. Yes. And how long were you there, approximately? Until um, after midnight, I believe. All right. So how long did it take you to do these various scans? Um, seven minutes per scan, roughly. Uh, there were, I believe, 10 scans in that one, so an hour, a little over an hour to All do right. one scene. All right. And what were the lighting conditions? Like, if you arrived at 1.50 in the afternoon, it's the middle of the day, correct? Right. It was a sunny day, right? It was. All right. Do you know the lighting conditions at the time of the crimes? No, I do not. I do know, in my scene, it appeared that it would have been uh, nighttime. It would have been nighttime? Yes. But you don't know whether interior lights were on or not. Is that fair to say? Are we talking about at 4077? Let's didn't talk at 4077. I, I do not know. I did not investigate that scene. Okay. Um, now, you had the various trajectory rods that you have identified, correct? Correct. Do you know the size of the bullet holes that those were placed in? No. It appeared, maybe I'm wrong, but it appeared that the rods were a slightly smaller diameter than the holes. Is that correct? Probably, yes. That's why I believe if you look in one of the photos, uh, we use modeling clay to center that rod in the hole. Okay, so you use clay to center it in the hole because yes. holes will vary depending on the caliber of, of the bullet that went through the wall, for example. Depending on several factors, but yes. Yes, several factors. If the bullet was tumbling instead of going straight, it would make a larger hole, correct? It would make a more unique shaped hole, and we would notice that. Right, of course. Um, I'm going to ask you if you could go to the overhead view of the trajectory rods. Is there a hard copy photo? Mm -hmm. I just need to know this one. Yeah, sure. Just read off the back. Sir, while that's getting set up, let me just show you State's Exhibit S1, little a. You recognize that? Yes. And little b, 5-1, little b, you recognize that? Yes. And 5-1, little c, you recognize that? Yes, I do. All right. And as I understand it, these are um, from the Faro scan. Is that right? The angular measurements are from the Faro scan, yes. And then the, the software... Um, that we use to produce that we can digitize the trajectory like that. Okay, so let's look at 5-1 little b. I believe that's on the screen. Okay. That's the overhead that's reflected in this photo. Yes. Let me just make sure I understand it. Now, there appear to be four different lines um, on this. Red, yes. yellow, blue, and green. Am I correct? Correct. All right, so are you indicating that those are four different shots into the trailer? Yes. Could it be more than four shots? Absolutely. If the, if the, if the gun or rifle was held still and fired more than one shot, would it be reflected in one line? Uh, it would take an incredible amount of marksmanship to hit the same hole, kind of the Robin Hood firing into the same arrow. Sure, sure. But it is possible. So each... You show the holes on the side of the trailer, correct? Mm -hmm. So this this laser, this angle, this colored line is going through each hole, right? The two holes, yes. I'm sorry? Two holes. The two holes. The entrance hole and then the second point. Right. And so if I understand this, and please correct me if I, if I say something wrong, but at the end here where this orange bush hog is, the lines stop 
and to the ground, it looks like. Is that yes. right? Correct. So from the angle of the hole, this would be the, the farthest point the rifle could be if it was firing the shots into the trailer. Yes. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. All right. Can you tell from this position whether a person is lying on the ground when firing those shots or not? No. We, we don't ever tell where a person was. I can tell you approximately where the muzzle could have been. And where was that? The weapon. Where would that be? It would be very low to the ground at that point. Low to the ground? Yes. And certainly no further away from the trailer from where these lines end, correct? Correct. But it could be between the bush hog and the porch. That is correct. So you can't tell where the shot was fired from. It was just along this continuum. Yes, somewhere between the first bullet strikes on the porch and where these lines ended in the ground. All right. And I think you said the distance from the door to the end here was 30-some feet? It sounds correct, yes. Okay. So it was within, the porch here is a few feet wide, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know by any chance? I could measure it if you like, but approximately maybe six, eight feet. Okay, that's fine. I am going to ask you to go back to your pharaoh because I want to get a measurement from inside the home that I could. Sure. Let me know when you're ready, sir. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, can you go to the area of the kitchen? Yes. Would you like uh, to scan from inside the kitchen? Inside the kitchen towards the bedroom where the bodies were found. Down that hallway. Okay, if you could turn and I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going further, please. Keep going. A little further. Okay. All right, if you could stop there. What I wanted, what I'd like, maybe it's not the kitchen, but it's the, the trail of blood going back to um, the bedroom. I thought you had a view from the kitchen previously. Yes, right there. Okay. Um, could you zoom in on the trail, say back by the treadmill? And do you, okay, if you could lower it a little bit more. No, I'm sorry, I guess the other direction. Okay, back through that trail, do you see a chair to the left? I do. Could you get closer to that chair? Maybe it's a different scale. Right there, that chair. If you could just center that a little bit. Right there, that's perfect. Okay, on this scene here, there's a wooden chair that I'm pointing to right here. Do you see that, sir? Yes. All right, and the trail of blood goes right between that and appears to be a wall to the right. Um, there is a bathroom in there, I believe. There is a void in there. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. There is a, a hole there. It's not a solid wall. There is, a, I believe, a bathroom. Understood. But there is a, appears to be a kitchen cabinet or a doorway here, is that? Yes, that's a cabinet. Okay, if you could go back down to the floor. floor. If you could measure, I'll point it out on the screen. Is this the edge of the cabinet where I'm pointing this kind of black area? Um, here? Well, down, yes, down here. Let me, let me rephrase that. 
if you could measure the distance between the blood trail here to the right over to the edge of that first leg, the top leg of the wooden chair. So the width here? The width, yes. Right there. 2.324 feet. So in inches, that would be 24 inches would be 2 feet. So that would be just over two, just over 24 inches. 27.88 inches. Thank you, sir. And now, on this chair, there appears to be a bag. Is that correct? A trash bag? Correct. Can you adjust the picture? There, there are many items in that bag. It seems to be full. Yes. And it's kind of expanding out over the edge of the chair. Is that right? Yes. All right. Now, when you were in there, moving around, you were very careful. I was. And you did not bother that bag or that chair or anything else. Is that right? Correct. Okay. I could have just a moment. Very much, sir. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Any redirect? I just have one one cleanup question with you, real quick. Yes. And it, it doesn't have to do with the ferro scan. The overhead images. You talked about the lines, and, and the lines in those overhead images were only lines where there was two holes, correct? Two points. Yes. Two points. Yes. So when I say two points, are you talking about like ballistic event, which is 3.0 and 3.1? You could go through those two points, right? Correct. You have to have a second point to anchor that. Otherwise, the orientation through one hole could be anywhere. Okay. So, were there other holes that didn't have a second point in that front area that you didn't get a trajectory back through? There, there could have been, yes. Okay. Nothing further? Anything further? From no, thank you very much, sir. All right, then you may step down. Uh, it is now, what, 4.30, I think. Um, Four twenty-five. so we're going to quit for the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you will have to be back at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, you'll be going home. Um, and so, again, the admonition is very important, especially when you're away from the courthouse. I, I guess it's there's more opportunity or pro, uh, to, for problems. So do not uh, discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning this case until it's finally submitted to you for deliberation and verdict. Do not do any research concerning this case as to the facts or as to law from any source whatsoever. Do not uh, view, uh, read, or listen to any reports or any accounts of this case from any source, and that would include internet sources, it would include Facebook, all the social media sites, it would also include uh, newspapers, radio, or television, no source whatsoever. Um, and have no contact, of course, with any of the participants in the case, including parties, counsel, uh, or witnesses. Does counsel for either side have anything further before the jury leaves the courtroom? No, thank you. No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, with that, leave your, uh, take your badges with you, but leave your notebooks on your uh, chair, and we will see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Assemble at the jury room downstairs.